There's your list. Okay, I'm good. Well, TC is good. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> and we are live. So. Oh yeah, I'm good. We're we're already. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are, ready to talk about what what game was this one? Is this one? This is gonna be uh, TC. You were gonna talk all. This is the episode about village, right? Yeah, this it's is got... it. It's a village. It's 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 stuff <laughs> and things, and it's got grande things, and you know. It's great. <laughs> no, we're we're talking about Biggie Smalls, the official board game of the assassination of the notorious B.I.G. Oh, Ooh. holy cow! Uh, <laughs> uh, Colloquially referred to as El Grande. <laughs> yes. Colloquially referred to. It's it's very popular in Guadalajara, and they call it El Grande there. <laughs> yes, the the Biggie, the Biggie, the, the Biggie. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> so uh, we have Mark Bigney. And we are going to be talking today about El Grande. This is uh, this is the Longview podcast in which we take a closer look at the games people play. I'm uh, hosting the the Longview today with my my buddy out on the West Coast, TC Reed. My name is Joe Salen. We got TC Reed out there, and he is uh, TC. It looks like I'm waking up. TC, wake up! I'm waking yeah. up. <laughs> if I wish I could, yeah. If I was right there, I would knock on his uh, his yeah. door here, splashing yeah. water in your face. You know. Yeah. Okay. I got coffee. <laughs> <I'm working. laughs> Splash some hot coffee in you. No, actually, maybe not. But oh, okay, I'll let you be the judge here, TC. Uh, no, uh, that's bad. That's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> He'll certainly wake you up. <laughs> Might be a little distracting for a little while. We have Mark Bigney of uh, originally all the games you like are bad, and now so very wrong about games. Uh, th- both of those are are just amazing sources of board game content. Um, some extremely well versed and well worded, eloquent responses, and uh, finally, since we're recording now, he's going to actually uh, start start opening his mouth. Right, Mark? Absolutely, it's a pleasure to be here, guys. <laughs> yes, thank you for the shout out for so very wrong about games. It was described by one Joe Salen as the single greatest board game podcast ever. Uh, <laughs> TC Reed noted that it is the only piece of media worth consuming in the universe, which I think is very high praise. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I would, I would, I would definitely say if you want a, a, a thoroughly honest review of Scythe, go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, when uh, I, I did feel, however, that when TC Reed said that listening to anyone else's commentary is akin to listening to the gibbering mad, uh, uh, the gibbering madness of a semi-literate moron, I thought that was a little bit too far. But whatever, I'll take his opinion. No, you know, <laughs> gibbering is a high rate, You know. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> You should hear what I tell my family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually a compliment. Coming from you. So, yeah, you, may, maybe some context would have helped out, but he no, he he loves your stuff. That's why he said gibbering, you know, gibbering, gibbering yeah. madman. And that that's uh, you know, I, I think really there you go, Mark. That's uh, you know, you can use that one. You can really well, sell your brand. We should put that on a t-shirt. Get yeah, some merch going. You know, Arkham <laughs> Horror. That you know, Cthulhu stuff is some of my favorite stuff. Yeah, gibbering is a compliment. Right. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's actually it, it's more of the the goal than you know than the byproduct. It is <laughs> reaching that eventual insanity. So, are you lapsing into the Tao of gibbering? Is that what's going on here? I'm lapsing into something. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it. We are with Taoists here. Yes, it is. It is more so about that. You know, that end game goal. Isn't it more about the journey than that, though? I suppose. You yeah. spare me that nonsense. I'm 100% <laughs> teleological all the way. <laughs> Whoa. So. <laughs> I don't know what you just said. <laughs> yeah. You, you, are, you are on another planet, man. It is the, it is the gibbering that we. <laughs> it is the gibbering. And, uh, you know, if, if you're looking for more of this gibbering, though, go check out that So Very Wrong About Games. It is a very intriguing, well um, well edited, very concise. You know, he gets those those episodes are down to just uh, you you trim off all the fat. I, I don't know like how you're able to get like just so much packed into to the amount of time that you guys have. It is it's uh, you know it gives me whiplash, and by the time it's all done, I need like you know all kinds of back attention. But I'm still happy I did it. You know, it's like that wooden roller coaster sort of. We get it down to that concise format precisely because we make up everything we say. Uh, half of the games don't actually exist, and sometimes I'm not entirely convinced that my co-host is a real human being. But uh, that's what you get for getting a couple degrees in philosophy. So, 
Yeah, it'll change you. It certainly is. Uh, it's like that metamorphosis into more of an abstract concept than a material being. Was that what that story was about? I always thought it was about a cockroach. <laughs> yeah, it was the the cockroach was the actually the the protagonist in the story. It was you know like that that should be what we are all trying to be. I, this, I I'm right there with you. This is some deep stuff. You're blowing mm -hmm. my mind here. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely you know our, our we're looking at deep uh, explorations of games that have been around a long time. So you know right now we're just solving you know the questions, the meaning of life. We're you know Kafka esque solutions to all of your daily problems like you know. having played a fair number of old avalon hill games from the 1980s edited by don greenwood i can definitely imagine that he wrote rule books having been inspired by franz kafka <laughs> that sounds terrifying <laughs> oh it is very terrifying uh, you know to connect these two uh, streams together you definitely need a sanity check to understand the rules for say upfront. <laughs> Yeah, and also to to be a part of that campaign, to have been a part of that campaign, I think your sanity needs to be consistently re-examined. Oh no, I'm talking about the original Avalon Hill production oh, yeah. from, mm -hmm. from 1980s. Uh, yeah. Well, didn't you also you also like the rule books like uh, Magic Realm and uh, Gunslinger? Is that you're familiar with those ones too, right? These Avalon. There, there are a games? couple of my favorite games from the era. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, and those ones, I mean, you, you're talking about a whole different brand, a whole different breed. And in a way, what we're talking about today, El Grande, the Cram Cromer, uh, no, it's not Cromer, I'm sorry, it's, uh, or no, it it's is. Cr Cromer and Ulrich, yeah. Cr Cromer and Ulrich, okay. Not Cromer and Kiesling, which nope. I feel like is the, the current, but this There's is Cromer magic and Ulrich. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cromer and Ulrich, it really is almost a, a, you know, so long ago that you can look at it, look back on it, and I feel though that you can't quite do that same. Like I feel like we've we are no longer in the Avonlawn Hill era, right? Would you Would you agree with that? It's like you know, oh, it's, definitely. Okay, well, considering Avalon Hill is <laughs> kind of exists in name only anymore. Well, is there? I mean, is GMT the new Avalon Hill? I guess this is you know this yes. is a, a okay. All right, one hundred percent. Fair yeah. enough. So so I'm GMT the, games, Avalon Hill games, kind of interchangeable. Well, then... No, no, I wouldn't go that far. It's just the market has changed so considerably. Avalon Hill for a long time was the only game in town, but their mm -hmm. output was eclectic both by virtue of that market situation and by virtue of their editorial policies. GMT is similarly eclectic sometimes in that, you know, they get Jeff Horger putting out something that isn't a war game or they put out something utterly bizarre like uh, Leaping Lemmings uh, in the context <laughs> of their catalog. Now apparently they're branching into 18xx. So in terms of a publisher that produces primarily war games, but also some other bizarre stuff, they're absolutely the same. I wouldn't say they're interchangeable, though. Richard Hamblin, who did Magic Realm Gunslinger and Merchant of Venus, uh, is no one has ever come close to replicating his, his brand of, of insane genius ever since. And a lot of the old Avalon Hill stuff is, still remains utterly unreplicable. But... Mm -hmm. If you compare GMT to other wargame publishers, like your MMP, like your Compass Games, like a whole bunch of other wargame publishers who only do war games, then yes, GMT is very much the modern-day Avalon Hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're branching out of those eclectic little, little, uh, you know, uh, other explorations. Like, like Absolutely. Welcome to Centerville, right? That one just came out, and that would be an example. And then, to a certain extent, you know, you also see like Dominant Species, which is a war. It's by a wargame designer, so you kind of can see where they're well, going the at. The same is true of Centerville. That was both designed by uh, those Chad, Jensen. Designed by Chad yeah, Jensen, who did Combat Commander. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so w the reason I was kind of looking on this is, you know, especially for gamers that maybe are, are joining the hobby fairly recently, like I would consider myself, you know, with with about five years or so of experience. Noobs. Yep. Noobs. Uh, absolute noob. And so when I look at you, like I'm the noob, <laughs> but I feel like I'm like the paleontologist and you know, like these games. And I'm the dinosaur? Like, yeah, yeah. You'd be the you'd be the dinosaur. Actually, no, you'd be like the um you'd be like the 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 park owner of Jurassic Park, that guy that's you know like the, the little flea circus and all the fleas, you know, that the guy that gives that speech. That's you. Um the, the, the dinosaurs in the gets game. a whole bunch of the eccentric who gets a whole bunch of people killed because he's irresponsible and arrogant. <sighs> Thanks, well, that's precisely. <laughs> you nailed Dude, it. I was I was trying to describe to Jill what got me into wargaming, and I told him my first wargame was a Dragonlance module called Dragons of Glory that came with a bunch of chits and stuff. And 
Joe had no idea what I was talking about. So it's nice to have <laughs> someone uh, around my uh, my own age space here. Mark, I appreciate it. <laughs> well, it's about institutional memory. Like I wasn't a gamer in the 1980s. Uh, I wasn't really a serious hobby gamer until about, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. But if you take these things seriously, as, as a paleontologist, I, you, you'll appreciate this. There's a sort of genealogy to all these things. And if you like seeing the development of ideas and you, you like to see the, the, the germination of design philosophies and theories and see how they mature, then you really do have to go to the back catalog of some of the Avalon Hill stuff to the 70s and 80s to really see where a lot of this stuff started. And indeed, to where a lot of this stuff has yet to be improved on. And I think that's very appropriate and allow me now to segue into the nominal topic of discussion because the same is very much true of El Grande. Mm -hmm. So when was this what, paleontology? What era are we talking about with El Grande? When was this release date? <laughs> 1995. There we Settlers go. Catan year, right? Yes, wow. the same year as Settlers of Catan. And well, that's like over 20 years. God, I feel old now. That's wow. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I didn't discover El Grande until the decennial edition, which was released mm -hmm. as one might expect 10 years later. <laughs> this was before everything and its and its dog had a big box, uh, whether it had you know one expansion or seventeen, mm -hmm. and it was you know the, the the first omnibus edition to 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 collect together the expansions, some of which had been out of print for a while. Yeah, yeah. Did Queen do that? Originally, it was Rio Grande <laughs> that uh, that did the decennial, and it's been reprinted a couple times. As the decennial edition, and then it was reprinted as a, a big box because that's what everything has to be called now. Yeah. Like big boxes, and they cannot lie. And yeah, I think it was Z Man <laughs> that did the most recent big boxes. Yeah, that, that, I remember seeing the big box. I was wanting to pick it up. I was like, "That's a lot of money for that thing." I just want the base game. <laughs> How much does it retail for now? Last time I saw it when it was in print was it was close to a hundred bucks. Yeah, that's... I want to say the big box is like a hundred. That's kind of ridiculous. Kind of <laughs> yes. Thank you. Come up with old timer. I remember back in my day when we could buy board games. For, uh, my Avalon Hill game only cost me twenty five dollars. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's strange. I I will defend. I'm a huge fan of El Grande. Obviously, if I didn't have a copy and the only way I could get it was by getting it new for a hundred bucks, I would probably do that. But it is the case that there are some publishers that are still putting out games at reasonable MSRPs. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not a huge fan of Portal games. A lot of their output, I think, is is overhyped nonsense, but they do put out games at a reasonable cost. If you look at, say, the components, just in terms of the components of, for example, 51st State Master Set, uh, it's a very reasonable deal and it's got a, a you know custom components in it. But El Grande, maybe actually now, maybe the problem now is if you just want simple wooden cubes, that's now considered a custom component because it's not the case that every other game has them now. <laughs> well, that, this one actually, the big box included all these little meeples too. Um, it, it, everything in my copy does not have, uh, it's in the big box, it's all little shaped like Carcassonne like meeples, but they're a little smaller than Carcassonne meeples because that would be unwieldy with the amount that you need to, to manage. So it, it, to, to continue what you're saying though, like the 51st State Master Set, I think Fantasy Flight also can really do some really good uh, bang for your buck. They put out to uh, Blue Moon Legends, which is like, you know, if you bought that when it was coming out, what is that like $150 worth of stuff, you know, and they put it all out together with like added variants that weren't even included in any of those. And they did that for like, what, 50 bucks? Blue Moon Legends was a ridiculously unexpected, unasked for gift. <laughs> <laughs> well, Blue Moon is my second favorite game of all time. I'm a huge mm -hmm. fan. I've been playing it ever since it first came out. And I was not expecting them to do such a beautiful omnibus edition. Yeah. It they probably sold them. about three. It probably sold about three copies because it's not <laughs> really. Yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate. I mean, I and I kind of saw that coming. It's you know the market has moved on in a very real sense, and if you I don't want to think that though, man. Like I want to like face the facts. It's it's an entire like you're buying an entire <laughs> card. You know, like a a card constructing system, you know, like so many people love that, love going into a game card constructing system. And you got this bar of entry that's so low to get all of it in this. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm done. I'm done. <sighs> Gate like blue moon legends. We played that one a few times. I need to pick that up. That was a fun little game. I liked mm -hmm. it quite a bit. I, I'm right there with you. I mean, that's it's, it's a weird gift Mark. And it is one that, you know, like you're, 
we're talking specifically here about games that have been around long enough to to warrant these sort of you know uh, master sets or or you know decennial editions or you know the what is it that the set I have a copy of the Seventh Seal that's like uh, who's that one that puts out all the movies. Yeah, Criterion Collection. Yeah, exactly. The, <laughs> yeah, the Criterion Collection sort of sets where they do all this work and put it all together, and then and then you look at it, and it's like fifty dollars for a DVD that I could go get from the budget place at Walmart for like six, but it's <laughs> the special features. <laughs> yeah, it's all. <laughs> well, the thing about Blue Moon, and to a certain extent, the the the, the same is true of El Grande, but not nearly to the same degree. Blue Moon is one of those deceptive games, very much like a lot of other Reiner Knizia designs, where the depth of gameplay is not immediately evident. Mm -hmm. It's uh, He's designed a, number, a couple of games that are so simple that it's a miracle that they even work. Yeah. Blue Moon, although not that simple, in terms of the core strategy and trade-offs, is pretty much on a par with that. It's so deceptively simple that it really takes a while to open your eyes to what's actually going on, that this is mm -hmm. actually an auction game where the value of the pot changes based on the number of cards that are that, that have been played. And so you see all these threads on Board Game Geek and elsewhere. It's like, this game is basically like war. If you can win a fight, you do. It's like, well, not really. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not surprised that it didn't get a new audience. Uh, I kind of hoped that it would, but I was in no way remotely surprised when it didn't. I don't know what sure. their sales figures are, but I think it ended up in their clearance sale or... Uh, I've, I've, seen it, I've seen I've certainly seen it in clearance in a number of uh, retail outlets, but I bought my two copies, so I'm happy. <laughs> well, it is good. Yeah, I, I think the two copies is is a you know, I mean, if people are going to get into it, it is one of those games you can get a couple of copies and and still be able to to use cards from both of them. Though it's not in any way a re requisite. So, um, with El Grande though, I feel like it's a little different. You know, it's I, I don't think that we have moved past it because I think. You know, I mean, like knock on wood, I guess, but I think we're going to see, you know, a 25th anniversary. You know, we, we've got the, the El Grande big box was a 20th anniversary. I think we'll see a 25th. I think we'll see about every five years we'll see something new coming out from this. What do you think about that, Mark? I hope so. I have no earthly conception of what is happening with the sort of middle range Euro publishers anymore. Rio Grande essentially is just involved in the occasional Race for the Galaxy product and Dominion, Dominion expansions, like and that's Dominion. fine. <laughs> and Mayfair is dead. And <laughs> Z-Man's Man, pandemic. Exactly. Yeah. Z-Man, uh, back when Zev was running it, I kind of had an idea of what the company looked like. Now I don't know what they're doing. I know a number of people who know uh, Sophie Cavell, who's now basically emerging as a major player, but it's not exactly clear what she's going to be doing overall in terms of the market and her sundry properties. So that that's a total black box to me. I'm looking forward to uh, Zev's new role at WizKids because they've been yes. putting out some surprisingly good designs. So Sidereian Confluence, whatever the thing that was. I never thought I'd see a game like that coming out of WizKids. I know. <laughs> and they mostly published it properly. And it's a stellar design. They're very, they, uh, I, I respect what they were trying to do with the Expanse. I don't think the Expanse was very good, but it's a you know, middleweight mm -hmm. Euro design. In fact, we'll have opportunity to talk about that later when we're comparing things to El Grande. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really, I really wish Zev all the best. It could be that WizKids is going to be the new sort of uh, a, a, a new prominent uh, Euro game publisher because I, I don't mm -hmm. know what Euro publishing is going to look like in the next five to ten years. But I certainly hope that a game like El Grande can remain in circulation. Well, I'm hopeful with that because you know WizKids gets most of their income from like Dice Masters and stuff. So as long as they sell that crap and make money, it can give the extra to Zev to find all this weird stuff to publish. And I'm <laughs> very happy with that. One hope. <laughs> One single print run of like 500 copies, and it'd be yeah. like just like the old Z Man. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I mean, but speaking of Sidereal Confluence, and no, it is impossible to say too many good things about it. I'm really <laughs> happy that it both uh, found a publisher. In fact, there were uh, there were two publishers in competition for it. My buddy Chris Cheslick of Asmati Games wanted to publish it too, but uh, the publisher went with. Uh, with Zev, basically, with WizKids. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that it found a publisher, and I'm glad that it found an audience. I was worried that a game like this with, honestly, let us be frank, one of the worst titles in the history of yeah. board <laughs> and, the, the the cover, and the cover of the box is like, maybe yep. that title, right? I'm like, whoa. 
I don't the know why this is. <laughs> the title's bad. The cover is awful. You know you've got a good title when you need to have dictionary definitions on the back of the box. Yeah. <laughs> a solid indication. You've got a good grabber there. Yeah. It's sold out of its first print run. It's getting amazing press, as it deserves. And this is a game about turning cubes into other cubes. And I thought I was done with games like that. But it showed me that I was wrong. And it's a it's it's a beautiful design, and it's getting the attention it needs. And it all of this without Kickstarter, without any minis, without any of the the, the standard other stuff. And so, in a sea of endless new titles, I'm glad that at least some visually unspectacular, potentially intimidating designs are getting the love they deserve. Absolutely, well stated there. I mean, it's it's an interesting and unpredictable, volatile market, but you know there are glimpses of hope in there. So Absolutely. with um with El Grande, we you know, we were talking about how like, you know, this is a product of a bygone era, but it continues to be relevant. I don't see that happening with other Avalon Hill titles. Now, what do you think keeps it coming back? Uh because in a very crowded genre, it has yet to be matched. Yeah. We're talking about area control games, correct? I'm talking about area majority specifically, majority, okay. but yes, okay. area, even even in terms of area control, I have other area control games that I prefer, uh, but I think that lumping together area majority and area control, although a legitimate tax, uh, taxonomical strategy, sometimes uh, elides key differences. But if you compare El Grande to certainly the other core area majority games, I don't think that any other game has come, come very close. And if you compare it to even lots of other uh, big fighty area control games. Most of the time, I'd still rather be playing El Grande. Mm. Hmm. How would you? Okay, could you distinguish between area majority and area control for for the lay people out there? And maybe for me, <laughs> maybe some some people don't understand the difference there. That's it. That that's what I learned from my wife. When you if you want to say that you don't know something, you say some people don't don't know the Joe, difference. Joe, this is what I'm here for. Just say explain it to TC. That's, that's all you need to say. That's all you need to say. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not. There, there are a lot of people who put a lot more weight on the emphasis than I do. And I think a lot of these categories, obviously, with the normal caveats, they're fluid. There's a lot of overlap. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and you know, even placing games in particular little boxes often doesn't matter. But to my mind, the key difference between area majority and area control is that in an area majority game, it is expected, or at least in most of the game, it will be normal for many people to coexist in the same space. Mm -hmm. Whereas in area control games, it is reasonable and normal and be expected that for at least some or, or most of the time, one player is going to be able to force everyone else out. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, a game like, say, Kemet or, you know, like kind of like a Precisely. fighting game where as soon as there's two players in an area, it's conflict area. And then, you know, you must resolve it. Whereas, you know, you're distinguishing that area majority games are ones where you are vying for, you know, having the most cubes in an area or the most the biggest presence in an area but not going to be directly you know like you are not always hostile towards each other i would put it as yes i agree commit is very much an area control game it has no elements of area majority the difference i i would put it is this and this is a rough heuristic is it the case that to do well in the game you can be in second place in a whole bunch of regions if the answer is yes, you're probably looking at area area majority rather than area control. If that's not a viable strategy, if the game just doesn't permit that, then you're probably looking at something more towards area control. And then obviously there are some hybrids. Uh, you know, the recent game Rising Sun is obviously a little bit in the middle. Sometimes you kill everybody, mm. but sometimes you don't. Oh, yeah. Sometimes you coexist in a variety of ways. But uh, another game where it's very much area control rather than area majority, again, very much with the fighting, is a game like Cry Havoc, where you coexist for a while, but that's only until the fight gets resolved. And then it, then one person will win and everyone else dies. Or Eclipse, same thing. You Multiple people can be in the same area, but that's only sort of a holding queue until the fight happens. And then only one person is going to be there. And so to my mind, that's more area control as opposed to area majority. Sure, so you, yeah. You were, you were saying that there were other games you... Yeah, you prefer to play over this one, uh, but you still prefer El Grande. What other uh, games that you uh, compare this one to that you enjoy playing? Okay, so in terms of area majority, uh, a game that I still enjoy very much is a game that was originally published as Web of Power or Cardinal and Koenig uh, by Michael Schacht, and it's been republished as China, and it's got a new edition called Han. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. is... 
uh, about a 30 to 45 minute game. It is tight, 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 and it is really, really well done. Mm. And so when it comes to area majority, if there's something I want that's a little bit, uh, uh, that, that, that's a lot faster and perhaps more accessible, uh, Han or any of the additions really uh, mm -hmm. will will definitely satisfy. And so I've got no uh, no qualms about that. So those two, El Grande and, and Han are, are pretty much the two paragons of area majority. I don't really have any, I don't really have much time anymore for any other area majority games other than those two. When it comes to area control, uh, there are a number of fighty games that I do kind of uh, overall prefer. But again, at that point, we're comparing apples and oranges. Uh -huh. like, like the Imperial games, uh, Antica, uh, those are both have elements of area control, and those are some of my all-time favorite games. And, and But they're, they're, they're trying to do radically different kinds of things. And again, mm -hmm. I don't want to lean too hard on these kinds of, of distinctions. There are also some games with some elements of area majority that are not the be-all and end-all of the game, like Empire's Age of Discovery. I'm a fan of that game. I enjoy it a great deal. Uh, and obviously, there are a whole bunch of war games that I enjoy that are almost exclusively area control. And those, uh, some of those, my all-time favorites are, I, I, I'd say, uh, preferable to be Del Grande. But again, apples and oranges at that point. Okay, I, I just, just curious. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Uh, a great way to sort of work our way into this, you know, like placing it amongst others of its of its kind and its peers. And you know, we're talking about a game that's twenty three years old now. So. You know, it's kept relevance for quite a while. For anybody who's listening uh, that's never played El Grande, uh, how would you describe it, Mark? You know, what, what are the mechanisms here that are on display? So the thing that sets El Grande apart from all its progenitors is the way actions are selected. It's a nine-round game in which there are going to be action cards that are set out at the top of each round. And each action card will have two elements. One of them is how many cubes you can place on the board. And the other is uh, some sort of special action. And the order in which these cards are claimed is a function of what power cards people play. At the top of the round, everyone gets to play one of their power cards. And everyone has the same identical deck of power cards ranging in number from 1 to 13. Mm -hmm. And these two have two elements to them. One of them is the number. But the other is the number of cubes that you get to move from your unavailable to supply to your available supply. And by the way, remind me to talk about terminology later, because that's one of the things I really don't like about this game. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. there's a trade off. The stock, the supply, like, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, don't get me started now, because we need to, I'm trying to remain focused. Don't yep, yep, here we go. So, so, so yes, the on target power card. The yeah, the number target. Will, will determine the order in which you get to claim one of these five action cards that's available. And there's an inverse relationship between the number itself and the number of cubes that you'll be able to get available. So if you're always playing high numbers, you, you're going to find you don't have enough cubes to put out on the board. But if you're always playing low numbers, you're always going to be left with the dregs of what actions are, are selected. Mm -hmm. so there's an interesting trade-off there. And then when it's a question of actually... Uh, when you've when it's your turn to act in the round, be, the power cards having determined the player uh, the player order, you then have this trade off between again the action that you wish to take and the number of cubes that you get to put out. Because obviously, as the game proceeds to scoring, if you have more cubes in an area than other people do, then you'll get points. Or indeed, if you place in a, a solid second or third, you'll you'll be able to get points. So obviously, mm -hmm. more cubes is better. But these actions can be incredibly consequential. Some of them are just not obviously advantageous, like the ones that say, pick any region and score it. Well, if you're in first place in any region, that is an obvious take. Mm -hmm. By the same token, there are other cards that say, score all the regions uh, of a certain type. And at th that point, you might be sitting there thinking, oh, I'm in first place in a couple of those regions. That's awesome. Then there are other cards that let you do massive things with cubes. There's uh, a certain category of actions called intrigue actions, which tend mm. to take the form of rearrange a whole bunch of cubes on the board as you <laughs> wish. And this is to say nothing of the king, but that's a whole thing in and of itself. But that's the key tension that I think that El Grande does really, really well. And a number of other games, I think, either intentionally or unintentionally have aped it. That trade-off between taking a card for the event and being able to put more cubes in the board. And that informs the prior element in the round of playing these power cards, managing your supply of cubes and managing your turn order. And this is, of course, on top of all of this, there's an additional 
strategic level as well, because there are two things that you need to manage over the entire course of the game. One of them is your deck of power cards itself, because these power cards, once played, never come back. So you might be thinking, oh, well, I've got this 13. That's awesome. Well, guess what? You have one chance in the game to play that 13. That's the only time you're going to be able to do it. And number two is your overall supply of cubes, because one of the things that new players consistently run up against is they just start running out of cubes. They're all on the board in places where they don't want them, and then they're not able to put out new ones in advantageous positions. And so those are, those are a couple of the considerations that really elevate the strategic consideration from what is mostly a tactical game in most instances and also really reward depth of experience. Yeah, I think you've really gone over how like a lot of these different elements are balancing and then they're leaning on each other. So you've got you've got two different sort of balancing aspects that sort of lean together to make the actual game. Um, what are you actually going to be rewarded and when are you going to be rewarded aside from what you've already mentioned, like the way that these action cards get taken. So what, what's, what's the goal here? Well, the goal is to put out your cubes and score points because this is a Euro game from the 1990s. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it should be forgiven for that. Are we, are we already into making apologies and, and accepting apologies? No, I've got, look, I've got nothing against uh, cubes and points. Uh, you know, Sidereal Confluence showed you can still do that in a modern way. It's just it's just mm -hmm. a question of, of, of how you do it. In the context, or in the, the newer printings, Little Meeples, which of course are also a, a suitably retro as well. <laughs> so El Grande is a little deceptive because when you're explaining the game for the first time, you'll point out that it's a nine round game and there's scoring after every three rounds. And that's true. But all these action cards that come out every round, many of them have scoring conditions. And so a lot of points can enter the system in those interregnum rounds. Sometimes not at all. Sometimes you'll go three rounds and nobody does any special scoring, either because the cards don't come up or nobody takes them, or they take them and bury them. Because that's another consideration. When you take a card for with a special action, you don't have to do it. You can just bury it because you know nobody else should be able to take it. And that's often a thing you need to be able to do. Uh, but roughly speaking, uh, every region has three point values associated with it. One number of points for whoever has the most, a points for whoever has the second, and whoever has the third. It's also got a reasonably good tiebreaker mechanism. Uh, ties are often uh, a bugbear in a lot of games of this nature, where you have complicated tiebreaker arrangements, or the the the, the score involves lots of uh, lots of math and dropping fractions, which can which is fine in and of itself, but can end up in very very bizarre and low scoring situations just by virtue of how the numbers sh shake out. Mm -hmm. uh, El Grande is great. If there's a tie for first place, both both players get the second place value, and then whoever's in third place gets the second. You basically just shift down a column every time there's a tie, and I find that tiebreaker really good. The tiebreaker in Han is also really good for, for much the same reason. It's very simple and it doesn't lead to, to people getting shafted by the points. And every region will score at least three times over the course of the game. But as I say, often based on what cards come out, it can be many, many more times depending. Mm -hmm. And you can even manipulate how many points are given during those, those three uh, guaranteed scoring as well. I mean, there's every little bit seems to have cards that will affect it. You know, it's like the one of those very first games that had that little... The, the caveat in the rule book that's like every rule on a card takes precedence over yeah. a rule in the rule book. It's <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. It's certainly no cosmic encounter, but it is the case that there is a large uh, sphere of possible effects that can take place. And you, I believe you were specifically referring to the uh, mobile scoreboards. These are little mm -hmm. placards that go directly over a region, and suddenly that region that was worth an amazing quantity of points has now been nerfed to the point <laughs> that it's worth <laughs> hardly anything, or and vice versa. Place. Yeah. Or that, yeah. Or that worthless region is now worth a ton of points. And <laughs> as, as, as in life, timing can be everything. And being able to seize on these opportunities is, is largely one of the things that makes El Grande great. And all, mm -hmm. I would be remiss at this point if I didn't mention the king, because the king is possibly one of the most consequential aspects of the game. Mm -hmm. It's gigantic, too. It's, it's, this is the most <laughs> impressive parts of the game, that's for sure. Mm. Well, look, it's, uh, it, 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 let's just not put too fine a point on it and say it is possibly one of the most phallic components in the entirety of board game history. Um, there's no, there's no mistaking it. Yeah, yeah no, it, it, it's been mentioned. Yep. I mean, it's, it's right there. It's the king. Um, <laughs> but uh, the less said on all that, the better. 
But the king will always be on the board. And one of the thing that's inter- things that's interesting, and it's a very, very simple and powerful rule, you just have to repeat it to new players about 10 times. Nothing <laughs> ever goes in or out of yeah, the king's the key. region. Yeah, <laughs> the, like, the rule it's book does this to you as well. Down. Yeah, well... <laughs> And then you the rule book is just like every that. single time. It, it's like the very first rule in the rule book is you can't touch the king's region, and then it reminds you during every new explanation, every new concept. Well, it's it's helpful. It trains you for explaining the game to new players. They say, "Well, what about mobile scoreboards? No. What about grandes? No. What about- <laughs> no. Nothing. The only thing that ever happens to the king's region is the king leaves the king's region. That's it. That's the <laughs> only thing that you can ever do to the king's region. But more saliently. And this is really what gives the game a sense of geography that a lot of area majority games don't have. Very Mm -hmm. often in area majority games, if you're able to put something out, you can just drop it wherever you please so long as the space is open. But in El Grande, the only place you're allowed to place cubes by default is in regions adjacent to the king's region. And since the king is constantly wandering around the board, not in a very uh, uh, fast and unpredictable way, but in a reliable way, he'll probably move about nine times over the course of the game, maybe a, a, a touch more. Uh, this really alters the geography. You're constantly fighting new battles. You're constantly being put in a new mm-hmm. corner of the board. What was safe one turn is in danger the next. Yeah, what, was com- what was completely locked down a moment ago and was not worth fighting over, suddenly a new front has opened up merely because the geography has, has altered subtly. It really is... You know, sometimes looking at Euro games, especially, you can say, ah, I see where that came from, or or that that seems like an obvious solution to a problem. The king is one of those elements in El Grande where I have no idea how or why they came up with it, and it just works so brilliantly, and it 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 really adds a lot of texture and nuance uh, to the timing of the game and about how the geography of the board evolves. Yeah. It really is a a, a masterstroke. Yeah. It, I love was, how it makes it fluid. I, that's one thing I was not expecting at a game from '95 with this drab of artwork is how fluid it just it just makes it. It's just it's it's things are just changing, and it's great. <laughs> and it's fluid, but it's not chaotic. That yeah. is a balance that is really really hard to strike well, precisely because at the start of every round you know what's going to happen. The effects are crazy powerful. And they're very, very consequential, but you know what they are even before you take your first move in the round, before you even queue up for turn order. So you know what your priorities are. You know what needs to happen and you know what needs not to happen. And that can inform what what you what power card you're going to play. And all of these incredibly consequential effects are broadcast before they happen over the course of the round. So it's very fluid and, the, and dynamic and the board position will be changed. But generally speaking, something isn't going to happen and you figure, oh, well, that was okay. It's not a hidden hand of cards where you play an action card and suddenly you were set to win because you're sitting on Murktal Rex, but suddenly you six hours is down the tubes because the game is nonsense. Oh, wait, sorry. I was I <laughs> it. I was thinking about something else. <laughs> oh, oh. Sorry, sorry. I, uh, I don't know what, what got in there. Uh, yeah, I don't know where that came from. I think, uh, yeah, just like we said, gibbering madman. Yep. Yep. There you go. Okay. We were, we were, we were at, uh, we were at, you know, you can see all these actions at the beginning of the round and that informs your decisions for where you even want to sort of, uh, place yourself, you know, maybe, maybe you see that there's two really powerful effects. And so you're like, well, I could get first place by playing this card or I could get second place. And that would be just as good and maybe even preferable because then I could make be like sort of more the reactive player and I could use, one of the two, you know, the remaining very powerful effect um, to, you know, to actually go forth and actually work against whatever maybe the other player that's played before me did. So I don't know, that's a really wordy way to saying it, but, you know, like a really interesting decision point there um, because you are like turn order here is hugely determined by players. Now, we were talking about the king, though, and I do think that what, what you mentioned, like you you pinned it down, Mark, because I didn't know why. I, I I accepted what what happens with the king, but I think it's because that the king moves around so fluidly, and there is incentives. You know, there is incentives for players to take the action that moves the king. Not only is it a very powerful and guaranteed scoring, where you know, like if the king is in your region, you just straight up like at the end of that scoring round, you're gonna get. You know, nobody can touch it. So it's like you're sort of making a, a region off limits, and. The, the thing is, though, like, so you got that incentive that's driving players to sort of move him around, but also it's the most powerful card in terms of how much it lets you actually put out on the board. So, I mean, the, the, 
you, you know, you've got incentives to kind of do the work that maybe the designers wanted the players to be in control of, which is to, you know, to, to tighten up an area control game or an area majority game where you're just able to vomit cubes out wherever you want to. And then that makes it much more about like, you know, like who do you trust? Who do you think is going to try to stab you in the back by getting, you know, getting more cubes than you, who are you going to compete with? And it's more about between you and the players. Well, now there's like that extra sort of gear that you've got to manipulate and it's somewhat being manipulated inadvertently by players that just want to score points by having the king in an area or want to maybe they actually want the king adjacent to an area so they can dictate you know the the actual places they're able to place units absolutely it is a very common tactic in one of the multiples of three rounds so just before a scoring round to want to grab the king park him in a region that you're winning and then know that you'll win take it during the scoring round mm -hmm. but it is also the case that many times instead what you want to do is instead use the king offensively. Park him not on a region that you're winning, but park him next to a region that you're in contention for so that then you can use your, your improved uh, cube deployment so as to overwhelm people. Because it is the case that although it is uh, the king effect is obviously powerful and it lets you put out more cubes, it's not always the first to be snatched up every round. Sometimes it's the second or third. And sometimes that's that's a reasonable recourse. And when that happens, you get that that just adds to the texture of what action to take. Because since turn order is so consequential, everybody knows in area majority games, you always want to be able to place last. Placing last is obviously the best. And in this game, normally when you place last, you'll have fewer. But because every time you claim a card, whether it's the king's card or anything else, you know what the possible universe of future actions downstream are, you are able, without much mental effort, to be able to game out what the possible contortions will be of, of future players' subsequent moves. And so if it's the case that you're taking the king, even if it's early on in the round, you can do that with the foreknowledge that you know the, 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 the possible consequences of other people's turns. And so... It's there's a lot of different ways to be able to exploit that power. Whereas in a lot of other area majority games, even ones with slightly more dynamic turn order, but especially ones without more dynamic turn order, it's just flatly impossible to protect yourself adequately if you're placing early. And so you just have to take some either safe, uninteresting, or possibly even trivial move because you don't know what the board state is going to look, look mm -hmm. like too far down the line. And then you end up feeling like you have wasted placements and then you again then you get in these unsatisfying tiebreaker conditions and and uh other things like that which is again why the, the 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 subtlety of the turn order and the way actions are selected in el grande makes certain that every action is as consequential as it can possibly be absolutely i i think that to illustrate this to bring up a totally unrelated game that also uses an area majority system, uh, a recent design released by Tasty Minstrel Games that was by published by Moai Ideas. It's called Jiraku, and it mixes together trick taking with um, area majority. And what's interesting about it is the first time that I played it, I really enjoyed it. We played it wrong though. We played it where um, you know your your card that you were playing. We played it almost like what I would call the El Grande variant, where hmm. the card that you played. Um, determine the later on turn order. Whereas the actual written rules are whoever wins the trick does stuff and then it just like goes sort of clockwise from there, if that makes any sense. Like you do oh. things like, yeah, it, it, so it's it's much more, like the clockwise structure is what really put me off about it. And I didn't understand, you know, like, like why I preferred it so much, but now I see like with El Grande, you know, the turn order is so hugely impactful in an area majority game because that getting that last the last laugh, so you will, uh, right before a scoring round is so crucial that you need to give players at least somewhat of an illusion of control over whether or not they're going to be the last one getting to place, the last one getting to react. And, you know, all these other elements can be manipulated by, you know, players taking the most powerful action first. And so, like, you know, you can sort of reduce the impact that, that turn order can have. So you're never like sort of, you know, a, a, a SOL or, you know, up, up a creek without a paddle. Um, just because you know you are going first in in the during the scoring round, you know there's, there's all these different elements that are now, that that are a big part of it. But that clockwise play in an area majority game almost ruins it. I think you hit the nail right on the head because I think trick taking games are a really good indication of why turn order, whenever possible, needs to be robust. Because in a trick taking game, since 
almost always whoever wins the trick leads off the next one. And you're going to be sitting in the same order for m more or less the entirety of the game. Who is sitting to your right and who is sitting to your left and what strategies they're employing or even just their relative level of skill can have a massive impact on how successful you are in the game. Or it can have a massive impact about how, how much control you have over your individual turns. In El Grande, wherever possible, and in most instances, turn order is a question of what strategic and tactical priorities you're willing to deploy and what resources you're willing to expend. There's one salient exception, and it's it's a bit unfortunate. The play of power cards is indeed clockwise from whoever played last in the previous round. Mm -hmm. So you can game it out so that you're going to play the first power card of the round, but you can't game it out in any other way. If you're sitting to you know the left or the right of somebody who always tends to go last, that can have a... a a serious impact on how things uh, how things work in terms of the order of power card play but that's not a huge problem because again when it's your turn to play a power card you can play any power card that you haven't played thus far ex uh, unless it's already been matched in the round so you don't end up in too many no-win situations like that whereas in lots of other games that take turn order less seriously you end up in forced plays far more often yeah arguably that entire first start of the round is because the designers didn't want clockwise play to just you know simplify the game they wanted it to be robust and so like you, you know when you first play you're just bidding over turn order basically i mean you're you know you're saying like this is how many this is how many cubes i'm willing to sacrifice to go early in the round almost well it depends even in the first round of the game it it, it really matters because you start with a certain number of cubes in your supply mm -hmm. and Sometimes at the start of the game, there are cubes that there are actions available that threaten that supply. Some of the effects yeah. are you can undermine someone's supply. And so you then have to start start thinking, well, if I go early in the round, if I go early enough, I can put out all my cubes and then I don't care because my supply was empty anyway. But then you do that with the knowledge that you're going to have to go later on in the round in the future to re recoup your supply of cubes. Alternately, you can try to go early to snag that action to hit everybody else, or you can go late with the with the understanding that you're not uh, with the expectation to take an action that won't put out many cubes onto the board, so the hit won't hit you that bad. So there are mm -hmm. all these trade offs. Once you see the universe of possible effects for the round, there's any number of different ways you can affect it, and this is true even on the first turn. Yeah, it is. It's starting right from the very beginning because that scoring can be triggered at any moment. You know, like your guaranteed scoring is going to take a few few rounds to kick in. Um, but because that that scoring can be triggered, you know, by a lot of those action cards that are available, you, it is right from the very beginning. And and not only that, Mark, but you've already mentioned how um, how you, you know this you have this uh, non replenishing supply of power cards. So that first turn, you know, what you have in your hand and what you don't have is is absolutely you know for the rest of the game going to put you in either a you know a more favorable or or you know less advantageous position with with uh in terms of whether or not you can actually jockey turn order to your benefit absolutely so um i've got here i think we've we've done a really interesting well done job so far with explaining the overall uh, you know, the overall goal of the game, getting the most It's cubes. good to be able to praise yourself there, Joe. That's <laughs> That shows a greatness of it, mine. It's critical. It's it, critical. Was the, it was the royal we here. We are talking about the king, Mark. You know, it, it's the royal we. <laughs> Joe Salen, very interesting, Joe Salen says. Uh, <laughs> and I, we just talked about what the king represents physically. Okay. Uh, no, move on, please. Move on. <laughs> Thanks, TC. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we haven't yet gone into some of the, what I would call like the more eccentric features. Um, and there's one in specific, and that is that every time that you're placing cubes, you know, or my little meeples and my my uh, big box edition, uh, my, <laughs> ma the maligned big box edition. And my edition, I put meeples <laughs> out. Yes, <laughs> it's the malign. You know, my, my my edition, which is you know, it's it's a it's an absolute, it's a travesty that you have to pay a hundred dollars to get it. Fine, but maybe some of us that was the only choice that we had. Oh and maybe we're happy Don't with judge it. Me. We're okay with it. <laughs> you see, can you make Joe stop talking about how much his box is bigger than ours? <laughs> I, I I've tried on multiple occasions. I just let him go until he runs out of steam. <laughs> That's the only uh -huh. I've got a little wallet picture that I keep of my El Grande big box, and I just would like to, you know, do you guys, do you guys have yours? <laughs> uh, oh, that's cute. It's so small. Uh, so, 
the thing is, we haven't yet talked about the Castillo. We have talked about the King enough. Now, the Castillo. Muy bien, Joe. <laughs> la es excelente. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> well, we are talking about, we've got two different Castillas here. Two, you know, Castilla la Vieja and Castilla la Nueva. And, and they're both, you know, the land of castles. So what about the castle? What about El Castillo? <laughs> Mark, what is it? What is the Castillo? Because it's just this gigantic foreboding like rapunzel-esque tower standing high it's bigger than the king (laughs) it is it stands higher than the king and it's a big old cardboard structure why okay so there's actually a bit of this is a a a, a bit of background the the legend is and i have actually seen the legend (laughs) oh boy by the designer by uh by by cromer was that the game was originally themed about the trojan wars Hmm. and the notion was that there are, that your 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 cubes or your meeples were soldiers and you were fighting over these regions. Uh, and the Castillo used to be the Trojan horse. And thematically, this is half appropriate, half inappropriate. It's appropriate in the sense that when you dump people into the Castillo, they will eventually emerge out and show up in a, a perhaps unexpected region. It is and that is appropriate to the Trojan horse. It is unthematic in that the Trojan horse is a trick that works precisely once. Uh, <laughs> you're not you're not prone to fall for that ploy again. again. And since it happens at least three times over the course of the game, that doesn't necessarily make sense. Anyway, uh, and this is this is back when um, in Euro publishing there was the strong thought that you shouldn't have games about fighting. That's distasteful. So let's instead make it about a couple of stern looking European dudes on, on a front cover and put everything, make everything cute. <laughs> <On horseback. laughs> how the, how the market has changed. But anyhow, whenever this is, this is one of the things that again, feeds into this notion of how dynamic, fluid and flexible El Grande is. I said before, and to a certain extent, that's correct. When you place cubes, it has to be adjacent to the king. And then the question is, well, what if there are no regions next to the king that I want to place cubes in? Well, I have an answer for you. Because in addition to placing cubes in regions adjacent to the king, you can also dump them into the Castillo, which is kind of like a region and kind of not like a region. It's off on the side of the board. It will score. Uh, you pull up the Castillo and you get to see what pours out and you will it will score exactly like a region would. But then every scoring round, everyone secretly selects a region in which all of their cubes are going to go from the Castillo. So if you dumped a whole bunch of cubes in the Castillo, either because you didn't have anywhere better to put them or because you precisely wanted to take advantage of the secrecy, that region will score, possibly netting you the five points of that place. And then you get to decide, okay, I want those five dudes that I put in the Castillo after scoring to then again show up and say Aragon or the Basque Country or Catalonia or, or what have you. And so potentially they get to score twice and it gives you this force that can be deployed, although it can only be deployed to one region. It is a threat that can seriously impact how everyone else decides to make their allocation decisions. Mm-hmm. It, this also introduces the specter of another very controversial topic in Eurogaming, uh, which is hidden trackable information. Because mm-hmm. although you publicly declare how many things you dump into the Castillo at the moment that you do that, then it's nominally secret. You're not supposed to be able to look inside and see. Now, yeah. I, I personally am, am relatively permissive about hidden trackable information. It never bothers me. And the people who really don't like hidden trackable information could play with the Castillo having you know, the, the, the totals of cubes in the Castillo being open, that I think would be a bit of a shame if for no other reason than the Castillo piece is rather intimidating and imposing. And, uh, you know, being able to dump them in has a certain tactile and, yeah, and the, audio satisfaction to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I know some pe- there are some people who refuse to play any game with hidden trackable information, and they play El Grande just fine. Uh, and uh, I, I, I feel sad. I feel sorry for these people. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm, look, I'm not a huge fan of hidden trackable information. And obviously, there's a limit. And some games I do play modifying the amount of hidden trackable information. But in El Grande, this is the only element of hidden trackable information. And it is just a little bit. And it is an, it is an element that you as a player can basically exploit as much or as little as you like. Because it's just, it is just an awesome option to put your resources there Mm -hmm. and uh mostly i like the castillo because it it theoretically allows you to have a piece score twice once for the castillo itself and once for the region where it shows up so that extra little flex bit of flexibility i do approve of but i see lots of players just never use it at all Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's another it's another little bit in which things are dynamic and fluid and it always gives you options even if you think the king is in such a way that it's blocked you from all the places you'd like to go certainly the the, the base formula here of El Grande 
is is fairly simple and intuitive and and i would say uh, like it's almost like so simple that it just it, it makes clear sense and then yeah. you add these like this is like the you know the sort of that that adding the pinch of garlic you know in in the form of like the king and then the castillo is especially Absolutely. because they're they they don't feel like they're big enough to characterize the entirety of the experience. I think that you mentioned that you know like it's an option. You don't have to go there if you don't want to. But what it does add is it it adds that little bit of you know uncertainty of where are they going to be going. Now it's it's really interesting because it it requires not just a component in terms of the Castillo, but then you have to like every single player gets now like a essentially a little spinner that's really more of like a hidden. Uh, way for you to choose a region, select a region um, simultaneously and secretly, and then reveal them all at the same time, and and then immediately say, "Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to say that one. I meant so much to say this <laughs> one. Now that I've seen what everybody's done, this is so much a better move for me. Do you guys mind? It was it was an accident. <laughs> okay, never play a game with Joe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it slipped. It slipped. My it's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was totally on this. Come on, look at look at this. It makes no sense for me to go there. Why would I go there? Oh, you, you, know, you, you, you put it I'm on the gonna... line so you can debate. It's either <laughs> yeah, I see how that goes. <laughs> Shove it the direction that I want. Yeah. <laughs> well, the dials are also used in some of the action cards. Yes. Some mm -hmm. of the action. Not, I feel like that component. Then it's like it's now validated in other elements of the game design too. But it's used differently in these action cards, right? Yes. It is the case that there are some action cards that uh, I quite like. One of them is everyone secretly chooses a region. All regions are scored. All selected regions are scored unless it was a region selected by multiple players. That one I quite like. That mm -hmm. gives you the ability to uh, possibly try to kneecap somebody if need be, or just go in. Uh, so sometimes it just amounts to everybody scoring one region of their choice, and that's fine. Sometimes though, it it adds that interesting level of well maybe I really don't want this region to be scored, or maybe I need to make sure that this person is kept in check, or what have you. There's another card that I like less, which is everyone selects a region, a region will score if it has been selected by more than one player. That, I find, does not tend to produce much. Uh, so, I mean, suffice to say that there's uh, a, a couple of instances of double think. Whenever the, whenever the dials come out, it tends to be used uh, mechanically slightly differently, but it always involves a certain amount of double think about trying to anticipate where other people are going to go and then either dovetailing on that or avoiding it or trying to kneecap it, what have you. Mm -hmm. It really is, yeah. And, and what can happen sometimes is, you know, like in any sort of a blind bidding situation, it's like I look there, I see that this is the most powerful player and this is where they could go. And it's like you end up, you know, in this situation where – you and another player accidentally like mutually I eliminate you know that sort of mutually ensured destruction while another player is like i guess i'll just take the most lucrative spot on the board uncontested i but don't i don't often see that happening though because generally I, I i rarely see this is one of the ways in which i think el grande really stands head and shoulders above many games of its elk, but also a lot of the other fighty games. In a lot of other fighty games, if A and B fight, C wins. In El Grande, that doesn't tend to happen nearly so much. Sometimes, yes, you can get into a pissing contest over a region and neither of you profit long term. But if you and I both select, uh, select a region, Joe, one of us is probably going to come out on top of that. One of us is going to come out the loser and the other one's going to get what they wanted. And then the person who made the mistake should not have uh, either needs to accept the fact that they were taking a gamble or they should have gone for a safer bet. Because again, you know what the values are that everyone is playing with and you know what the values are on the board. If you want a safe bet, you can go take a safe bet. If you want to gamble and if you if you accept the fact that one of my selections can indeed hose you, you have to take you have to be willing to accept that chance. Very rarely it happens. I can mm -hmm. see that it happens, but very rarely is it the case that multiple players end up basically canceling each other out entirely in terms of the scores like maybe you could you could orchestrate a bizarre multi-way tie that then makes it so that some other person who isn't involved in a tie comes out but generally speaking if you're very sad that i put my pieces somewhere that's probably just because i'm beating you outright <laughs> that's very true it, it's not it's more the outlier but i feel like it's one of those where it's just a when people aren't as experienced with the game system and they make what they feel is a safe choice um but then you know ends up getting you know they, they weren't Obviously, they weren't considering enough variables. 
True. It's, it's, it's an interesting cousin, I think, to hidden trackable information. A number of people feel very strongly uh, that hidden trackable information is inappropriate for games because it's testing a skill that they don't think is appropriate for board game success determination, namely memory. Mm -hmm. But double think and being able to anticipate what other people are going to do, which in philosophical circles would be referred to as a theory of mind, a lot of people have trouble with that and are very, very, very bad at internalizing other people's motivational structures. Mm -hmm. And these kinds of games, which are called coordination games, uh, where the participants win or lose if everyone guesses the same answer, some mm -hmm. people automatically internalize that logic and do very well, and other people don't. Yeah. It's it's just another set of skills that we as board gamers are sometimes called to to take up on. And it is one of those things that because it's simultaneous action selection, the outcomes you can't predict, but that doesn't mean that they're random. It's, an, yeah. it's a purely deterministic outcome, and it's testing a set of skills that is not perhaps one of the core tactical or strategic decision-making skills of a board gamer, but I think it's definitely fair game, and it's an extra little element of uh, interest that I think that El Grande brings to the table for those times when the dials come out, which is not all the time, but regularly enough to be interesting. It's interesting. Well, when it does happen um, from an action card, a lot of times, like, it'll say specifically um, to, you know, this is, I, I want to hear your take on this, Mark, because it, it's it's fascinating. Um when it says everybody select secretly select a region score that region but if two players select the same region cancel it nobody scores it right what what does that do well as i say much of the time it results in everyone scoring a region of their choice and it helps you it helps compensate so there's a natural tension in area majority games between the strategy of coming in second or third in a lot of different places and or fighting for those big regions. And it can happen as a result of player choices that you end up piled up in a relatively large region. And sometimes a game system needs to let you be able to exploit that when possible. And El Grande does that in two ways. One of them is an intrigue actions, which can allow you to pick up a massive pile and just distribute them as you want. Uh, another way to do that is precisely in those actions that just let you score a region of your choice. Now, in the context of the specific action card you're talking about, when it's just everyone scoring a region of your choice, I feel it helps compensate for those issues of, of you know, overcommitting. Uh, over but mm -hmm. if it's the case that it's a really tight game, and a lot of games of El Grande are really, really, really tight, mm -hmm. sometimes by virtue of I, whether it's mobile scoreboards, whether it's a special, uh, another action card that's been deployed, the location of the king, any number of factors, maybe it can come together that it is in my interest to make sure that you don't score rather than, than my scoring. This is one of the rare elements of, you know, take that in El Grande. It almost never happens. Uh, mm -hmm. But sometimes you need to be able to pointedly hamper someone's ability to score their region. Now, all of that having been said, if you're sitting on a region that can score 11 points and you know, you're know you my closest competitor and it is better for me that you not score than for, for, for it to score, uh, then you end up in perhaps one of those classic I cannot drink the wine in front of me situations. <laughs> I am expecting you to pick the 11-point region, but you know that it is in my interest for me to not let you do that. So then you think maybe <laughs> I will select that region. But then if you select a different region, then I have am the one who's triggered you scoring that region, and I have been the cause <laughs> of my own downfall. Yeah, you could, that's what's hilarious is like I could put on, you know, there's one 11-point region, as you said, and and <laughs> it's just hilarious to think that, you know, like I'm trying to cancel out your scoring. Right. And, and then you anticipate that, choose a totally separate region, and then I end up triggering your 11-point scoring. Precisely. It's it's a function of how much risk you're willing to tolerate, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if everyone at the table is very risk averse, then everyone is just going to select a relatively modest value region in yeah. which they are winning. And that'll just go and do its thing. And that's fine. Sometimes, though, it can be the case that a couple people are vying for the lead and there's a very, very valuable region, and then suddenly you end up in all these complex situations. Of course, if it's a very valuable region, and I'm a strong second in that region, and you're only going to get three or four points ahead of me by virtue of that, I'm going to score as well in that valuable region, maybe I'll just let you have it anyway. So it, it, it's all these, it really is dependent on the board state and your tolerance for risk and your expectation of what everyone else is going to do. And rarely does a game, certainly a game of this depth, 
uh, sorry, of this complexity. It's a deep game, but it's not very complicated, as you said. Very rarely do you get those kinds of moves where all of these factors can influence what you're going to decide. But El Grande handles it, I think, seamlessly. It's not my favorite action card, but it but it is interesting. <laughs> Here. All right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm here. I'm here, but there is barking going on in the background, TC. If you could see in the chat, I've, oh. been, I've been typing that it's still barking oh. and still barking because I, I want to talk, but I'm, I wasn't going to. Oh, as you can I, hear, I, I, it's barking in the background. Yeah, so. Oh, I just see yeah, a whole bunch here. of numbers here. In the, I need to scroll down to see what the new uh, yeah, chat is. Yeah, okay. barking, That's still barking, fault. still barking, <laughs> still barking, still barking. So, yeah, that would be what my, what my chat has been. So, okay. Yeah. Yay, yay. <laughs> break the fourth wall here. So um we gotta break something. <laughs> so yeah, break. The thing is, like, what we've got going on here is a lot of different elements that can sort of impact and affect that sort of the permutations and, and what things what happens is a lot of decisions that get made in the early game are continually being brought back to the forefront just by nature of how the game continues to evolve. And, you know, it's it's not – I mean, yes, you've mentioned, uh, Mark, that the intrigue action allows you to basically pick up and rearrange cubes how you see fit in, in regions. So, I mean, the, the amount of impact that you can have on that board is still going to be continually – you know, like, it, it's a big part of it. So it's yeah. not to say that just because you put a cube on there in round one, it's still going to be there in round three or mm -hmm. four, right? It's But here's, here's a, a question I have for you. The game itself – is three three rounds of three like turns you know I, I don't know how to say that there's like a total of nine turns and there's like your scoring is every three rounds so right. you have essentially nine rounds in the game but there is an introductory game that i believe limits the amount of of rounds between scoring to only two so essentially you're going from nine rounds to six rounds now it's acceptable to play that for an introductory game why not like do you ever find yourself going back to just playing the six round game is it you know because the, the game's roughly about 10 minutes per round it seems like about a 90 minute game which is definitely getting into the you know like a the longer game territory um especially if you're trying to to play it for the first time now you know like i find it fascinating that there's like this introductory game but then there's like the the long game what why would you play the longer game as opposed to this introductory game that the game literally tells you to start with that's shorter yeah, I, I I remember playing the introductory game when I first learned it, and I haven't played it since. So this is uh, several years ago, so, so keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. There are two reasons off the top of my head why I would not play the introductory game, even with new players. Okay. One of them is, and this is very important, it is possible, especially, well, not even especially, but even on the first turn of the game, for a single action to disgorge perhaps as many as 20 points to a single wow. player. Okay. And it is very frequently the case, especially with new players, that they look at them and say, oh, the game's over. Nothing, nothing can be done to do that. And that's nonsense. This is a fluid, dynamic game where uh, just the last time I played, for example, after the first turn of the game, literally the first turn, somebody was sitting on 25 points and nobody else had any points at all. And we figure, oh, that's done. No, the end of the game was very tight. That player came in third place and they were five points behind the, the, the first place player. You need that amount of time to make sure that those early leads uh, can be tempered with, uh, with future actions because it's not... I, I'm hesitant to use the word swingy because that has lots of implications, particularly about luck. And I don't think that El Grande suffers from that. But it is swingy in the sense that there can be very, very consequential turns. And so in a six-turn game, I think the effects of those consequential turns might be brought just a little bit too far. Whereas in a nine-turn game, there's, there's time for those effects to be mitigated somewhat. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing that I'd say, which is more minor, but is, is more and more consequential the more times I play, actually, your supply of cubes, getting all 30 of your cubes out on the board is not especially difficult. Indeed, sometimes the more difficult problem is you, you're sitting around the turn seven or eight 
and you look down at your total supply of cubes and you realize you don't have anything else to put on the board. Yeah, so you're done. <laughs> you're, you're done. You're spent. Yeah. And so that's one of those things that I've learned now to flag to new players. You know, in a, in, a, in a nine round game, you've got 30 cubes. Do the math. That means that if you're reliably placing four or five cubes every turn, you're going to overcommit earlier on and run out of gas and not be able to contest things as much later on. And that, again, one of the rare strategic elements of El Grande, because again, most of it's tactical, is I think an important element. And it really helps balance out uh, the it helps balance out and reinforce the notion that sometimes you really want to take those two and three cube actions. That going after the five and four cube actions all the time that's not as uh, that that that's not as smart a way to go. But in a six round game, if there's only going to be six rounds, you can put all five cubes out every round if it's a six, if it's a six round game. And so uh, that supply doesn't really uh, come into the same way. And I, and I do kind of like that overarching supply limitation. It certainly adds an element to the game, like you said, that's more strategic. I mean, you know, you're you're managing an overall pool and there's no coming back from that, right? And I think that that's, that gives it like that sort of like heavier undertow to what you mentioned is a supremely tactical experience with you being able to have very drastic effects. Now, I would say that if, if there's a 20-point swing that's happened, usually that has been something that players have manipulated, jockeyed to actually make it happen. So if that can happen, like, you kind of almost have to occasionally salute the player that's able to make that happen and not just, you know, complain and gripe and, you know, the game is is totally broken, right? Usually, or it's, it's Usually not always. If it's the case that in an early round of the game, you get one of the special scoring cards out that says score all the four and five regions. If somebody's able to snag that really early on a mostly empty board, populate those regions with one cube each, score them all, that can be a massive early swing. But... Mm -hmm it's usually something they had to pay for. Often they had to pay the 13 power card to do it because everyone mm -hmm. saw it on the table, immediately did the calculation about how much it was worth. And then they often then, uh, it, it has a strategic cost to it. And that strategic cost is often felt in the longer game as opposed to shorter game. So I agree with you entirely. When there's a massive swing, usually you've, you've earned it. But generally speaking, if you haven't earned it as much, if you just capitalize on the open board, you've had to pay for it. And, and in the nine round game, that payment will be felt more than in the sixth round game. Definitely, yeah. I, I mean, I, I see what you're saying there. Part of this is because you are able to decide when you take a uh, one of the the cards, the action cards, um, you, you can decide whether or not to use the cubes, you know, to put the cubes out on the board first. Yes. Or or after. or after. So you're really in control of of what you can do with that card. So, but you are able to manipulate it that way sometimes too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, lo long story short, the nine round game is more strategic than the six round game. And mm -hmm. in a game that's mostly tactical, you want to emphasize that element of st uh, strategy as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, you don't even really get to it. So, and uh, I, yeah. I, I honestly don't, uh, I don't begrudge those extra thirty minutes. Now, I mean, the length of the game is a bit of an issue. Uh, it's, I wouldn't say that the game is. I'm glad the game is not longer. Let me put it that way. I think it's, it's definitely, um, it's, it's, it's a reasonably. Uh, it's a reasonably meaty full experience. I don't begrudge the last 10 to 15 minutes of the game. I'm not checking my watch, but if the mm -hmm. game went past 90 minutes, I think that would be a serious problem. Yeah. It, well, and it, it, with newer players, it can sometimes, you know, because you're, there really is the permutations of like, you know, here's the five action cards. I've got to make some tough decisions right from the start. And then even once, you know, once you do get to choose from your action cards, there can be, you know, two or three action cards to choose from. You got to decide like, you kind of have to not just think like offensively, but you've also got to play defense because Absolutely. anybody that can go after you, can, you know, can totally undo your turn. And so there is quite a bit of thought that can go into each of these rounds. Um, and then not only, not only, you know, to, to choose your card, but to then at the very beginning of the round, evaluate which, you know, which cards you're sort of okay with, with giving up and which ones you want to make sure like, you know, you don't have happen to you. You know, it, it's, there's a lot of prioritizing you've got to do. So it, it's it definitely is one that has a lot more thought in it than what I think was the standard of of the time, like standard Euro games at the time. Where you know th this this is a design that sort of I feel like is is in many way a precursor. You know, like having this variable turn order. Like a lot of the the things that have been added to other successful board games to bring them up a notch were already present in El Grande by virtue of its balance and its its uh, really intricate design work 
um, by these two very uh, story gentlemen uh, designers. Well, let me, let me go you one further. I think in addition to, yes, I mean, it's it's robust in the sense that it has uh, variable turn order and all those other things. I think that one of the, probably one of the most seminal developments in wargaming evolution of the past 25 years or so, namely ops versus event tension. Yes. Right. In in card driven games where you have a tension of playing a card for uh, for ops or an event. Uh, now this this game did come out after the card driven war game genre was invented because We the People I think came out in 1993. Let me double check that. Yes, We the People was published in 93. So this came out 2 years after that. But uh, this this notion of having this tension between a card that is, will give you a certain amount of, let's say, movement capability in the sense of putting out cubes and having an event. And there's usually a tension between the strength of the event and the number of cubes you can put out the, and how many resources you're willing to devote in order to get at that queue. That is the kind of thing that I think motivates a lot of the ten tense decisions in games like Hannibal Rome versus Carthage, mm -hmm. yeah. in games like Twilight Struggle, in the coin games. And yet it does it here with uh, uh, you know the se the same sense of of cleanliness that you would expect and straightforwardness from a, a a Euro design, and it still does get you that additional layer of tactical and strategic complexity and of many follow on effects and ripple effects of events on cards without the rules overhead, without having to uh, to, to to teach all those complicated interactions. So it's got all these sub mechanisms that are introduced. You know, a whole bunch of blind weird blind bidding mechanisms, but they're all on event cards in the game that come out at the beginning of the round and you know they're going to be there. So the rules explanation you don't suffer all these all this rules glut like many many euros do about mechanism upon mechanism upon mechanism and all this other complicated stuff. Uh, you know, the, the system isn't opaque. The game state is opaque because of all of the player decisions and the dynamism. And mm -hmm. so it really is the case that when I play a lot of these other uh, card-driven games from GMT or whoever else that, are, that basically boil down to area majority, and here I am specifically talking about the coin games because the <laughs> coin games are more or less dressed up area majority games with incredibly mm -hmm. convoluted and I, I think this is a fairly new, no, no, okay, this is a fairly neutral statement. Let me rephrase it a bit. With incredibly complicated and layered scoring conditions. Mm -hmm. with, yeah. very, uh, with, with, with a whole bunch of follow-on effects that are not immediately evident from when you're placing there, with a whole bunch of asymmetry in the system. But El Grande, in many ways, is the forerunner to the coin games because it's mm. about manipulating an, uh, a card queue and about being able to expend resources to snatch up and act on events with a sort of ops versus event tension. And so one of the main reasons why I don't enjoy the coin games is after six hours of an incredibly complicated and multi-stage scoring conditions where in classic Volko Rinke faction, in order to score, you know, A needs to be true and B needs to be true only if it's rainy on a Sunday and C is true only if 11.2 <laughs> is observed. <laughs> and... And this is not just about complexity. This is about convolution because I play I play me some consims and I love me some complicated war games. But every Volko Rinke design leaves me feeling like an idiot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that again, that central tension about committing to a region in a universe where there's an ops versus event tension, you get that in your 90 minute game of El Grande, even though it only has a 10 minute rules explanation, and you're going to be out of there in uh, in an hour and a half. And that, I think, is a testament to how 25 years ago uh, that kind of that kind of design brilliance needs to be respected. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It has not lost over its time. It has not lost out um, to these. You know, other things have added. Maybe you know sub things that you might subjectively prefer. But I feel like at its core, we don't see a replacement. Yeah. The the, the thing I wanted to kind of bring up, we haven't yet talked about it, but the actual piece that the game is entirely named after, El Grande. <laughs> like, you know, everybody's... Like, it, what does this piece really add to the game? You're talking about one larger cube, or in my version, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> and the bigger box. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, the bigger box, which is, yeah, it's nice. You know, it's actually got a lot of space in it. It's at organ Anyway, um, the larger cube, though is like each player, you don't really get to choose um, where this thing goes at the start of the game, right, Mark? Correct. It's it's placed randomly, and 
the Grande, by the way, El Grande is Spanish for the Grande. The Grande. And, um, <laughs> it will move very seldom. And I, I agree with you. Look, there's a reason why we're an hour plus into this discussion about the game and we haven't discussed the eponymous component. It is <laughs> in a game that is very, that is mostly very clean and very tightly designed. It's probably the, the single most superfluous element in the game. <laughs> right? I think we can agree on that. It's not especially consequential. Uh, sometimes it's the case. I've seen lots of games where no one ever makes advantage of it. It's mm -hmm. also a little bit visually confusing because it's such a large piece, but it doesn't contribute to your control in the region, which usually throws new players for a loop. I mm -hmm. don't know why... I, I, I wish I wish that the, the, the titular component of the game were a little bit more consequential. It's possibly they, they should have called it like the, the king, you know. Yeah, the, I don't know. That would have been Castillo. <laughs> I, I would yeah, El Castillo would have been better, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. but then of course it would have had the double L and then then your 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 countryman might have gotten a little bit confused, but whatever. It'd be it'd be yeah, it'd be like people saying Lagrangia. <laughs> <laughs> It would, and it even. I think the Castillo in the game is actually placed on like Ibiza or one of the Balearic Islands. Uh, it, you know, it's it's weird to think that you know where people are all going to party and take pills now was you know where apparently you sent off your workers to 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 live in a huge, you know, like essentially the Rapunzel Tower. <laughs> <laughs> well, the game, the, the, I, I believe that the game rules make mention of the fact that the Castillo represents fortifications that were spread out throughout the entirety of of the the country which is just bizarre uh <laughs> you know in in classic euro game fashion them attempting to explain the, the the historical significance of all these pieces is is borderline ridiculous <laughs> uh, yeah it, it it is i agree with you that the that the actual grande piece is not worth much i mean it's essentially it just contributes to if you win a region, but it's only to the player, you know, that owns that El Grande piece. And so essentially what it does is it gives you sort of a home base, a place where, you know, is more beneficial to you, more lucrative to you. But for other players, it would be beneficial to them if they were seeing you as a threat to specifically interact, you know, with you, because it's not, it's, it's going to be more of a penalty um, to the player that's grande is being, you know, contested than it is, so to say, for the player contesting it. It's not like you can capture your opponent's grandes or anything like that. And like you mentioned, it's a confusing piece because it, it you know, like to compare it to Carcassonne, because, you know, some of us have, me have meeples in, in our, in our beautiful, you know, 20 year, year uh, editions of the not game. Getting you know? <laughs> <laughs> in, in Carcassonne, that big meeple is used it's it's like a regular meeple only better right here the, it has a totally separate you know almost making it a cube was misleading i, so, I agree entirely it would look best case scenario what it does is it gives you uh, a short-term goal or at least identifies a province that all things being equal you should probably try to win above other provinces of comparable value mm -hmm. so in case it can help break being entirely indifferent to all the provinces on the board, I guess that, but it's Which so, is only going to be important from the very beginning. So maybe, you know, like when you need direction, a certain set of action cards, mostly the action cards will help differentiate the, the regions well enough and the location of the King. So yeah, I agree that, that, that visually it's a little, it's a little uh, confusing potentially the number of times where you have to remind somebody when they're playing it for the first time, no, this large cube does not contribute to your presence in the region. Only these smaller <laughs> cubes do, which is strange. <laughs> Isn't that one worth five? No, it's it's not worth anything. Yeah. It just marks your, your home territory. Exactly. You know, they should have made it like, yeah, it should have like made it like a little, I don't know, just like a little cardboard thing that you could place, you know, that, 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 that way it's not confusing as it is, but, you know, it, if that's the most that we can really levy towards it, it's not that big. It, like you said, it's not that consequential. It's one thing that you can easily overlook. It's more of a frustration for from a learning perspective. But once yeah. you get past it, it does have a gameplay effect. It does do something, you know, to, sure. to prior, help you prioritize at the beginning. Um, though, you know, though, though we might feel a little bit, you know, have mixed feelings on it. Um, can we talk a little bit about terminology then? Yeah, let's get there because yeah. that's yeah, that was that was one that you wanted to bring up. So what what about this terminology is specifically uh, bothers you? What is it that it's te molesta to 
<laughs> yeah, sure. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna continue to whip out my uh, four years instruction in Spanish to attempt to engage <laughs> you in, uh, in that fine language. Um, look, it's in every in every game of this ilk, and this is also true of another game we both love, Joe uh, Hansa Teutonica. Mm -hmm. There's always this question of what do you call the supply that's immediately available to you, and what do you call <laughs> the supply that's not available to you? Mm -hmm. Right. It is a recurring problem, especially in games of this era, and I. For, for purposes of just ease of, of comprehension and remembering, because, you know, nine times out of ten when I'm pulling out these games, I don't want to have to check the rulebook for anything other than possibly just basic setup information. Mm -hmm. And I refer to them invariably as your good supply and your bad supply. Your good supply is what you can use now. Your bad supply is what you can't. And that, can, and that, work, and that works just fine for almost every game in its ilk and let me tell you this is <laughs> <Bad supply. laughs> I, I have this is possibly just a, a a tale of my being an idiot more than anything else but more than once i believe it was literally twice i have explained the entirety of el grande the game not that not that the explanation takes too long using only terms that I thought would make the thing, the game most comprehensible. I didn't say caballero, I just said cube. I didn't say <laughs> provinces, I said bad supply. I didn't say court, I said good supply because I couldn't remember and I couldn't be bothered. And I was like, screw it, provinces versus court? That's not an immediately intuitive <laughs> distinction. I'll just use good supply and bad supply. And then mm -hmm. when setting up, I was revealing the first flop of action cards. I'm like, oh crap, you guys need to know the technical terms because the technical terms are referred to on the action cards. Uh, okay, uh, I bet they're Let's pretty dumb action card, I'm willing to bet, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Started talking about, you know, these things go to the provinces and these things go to the court. And I immediately looked at it and said, oh, great. So much for my grand strategy of making things more comprehensible. Mm -hmm. I only remember the differences between provinces and court uh, because I've played the game enough. Honestly, mm -hmm. I can understand the justification for why provinces are bad supply and court is good supply. That kind of makes sense. But I could easily be persuaded that the alternate explanation, that the different <laughs> version where court is the bad supply and provinces are the good supply, would work just as well because you're spreading out to the various, oh, I don't know, provinces of Spain. <laughs> uh, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, where, where are these provinces if they're not the ones that you're going to on the board? Exactly. This seems good. Why are these in the bad pile? <laughs> exactly. well, I, I don't, I re, again, I respect the fact that they were trying to make the game thematic about palace intrigue in 15th century Spain. But uh, Screw it. These are cubes. These are cubes <laughs> that are either in your good supply or your bad supply, and they're going on regions in the board. Why are you trying to... Uh, I... I <laughs> Calling them caballeros doesn't annoy me very much. Fine, they're caballeros, whatever. They're, they don't look like they, they're on horses, but fine, they're on horses. And But uh, yeah, the, the whole provinces versus court thing just annoys me a little bit. Yeah, it's the same way in Hansa Teutonica. It's like this yep. is your supply versus the stock. And it, yeah, yeah, those could be super interchangeable. You know, the, yeah. they, they are there, arbitrary. There's no, there's no text. So I don't... I. I always when playing Hansa Teutonica, and indeed everyone I've taught Hansa Teutonica to in this city, they only talk about good supply and bad supply. And like, oh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny. I ran across the same situation playing Notre Dame. You know, yes. to, to decide, well, why is this over here? Why we call it? It's like, well, no, we put these groups next to the map. These are, you can't use cubes. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> But this, and when I explained it, there's like that one guy that comes out that lets you pull from that pile. Because I said, you never touch this unless you pull my but, but this guy lets you do it. Ah, fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any game like this, you there 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 has to be a weird set of uh, weird set of terms, and it's just in most other games, there's no text involved, so you can call them whatever you want that will make sense to people around the table. But here, it has to be provinces and court, and it's it, it's just been rote memorization for me. That's the only way I remember it. Yeah, when well, I didn't even remember it until you brought it up, like it was something that was far from me. You know, like I remember Hans. For me, I've played Hansa Teutonica more, and that's why it's like stock and supply. Those immediately are what I would want to refer to them as because we've already got that. You know, that uh, schema established that you know your stock is your stock, and the you know or the stock that is was very the insightful, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> very insightful yeah and i was already even confused it was not only insightful it was misleading the stock is what you can't use the supply is what you can use and what you... really i would have assumed it was the oh geez yeah is I, it good I, or I, bad <laughs> <laughs> I, I i like the idea of good supply and bad supply but because the you know because you're reading text on cards you're gonna have to stick with the court and the provinces and yep. then make that you know that sort of justification of the provinces the card, or... i guess <laughs> sure, I mean, card sets. But look, this is this is another the reason why it won't work in El Grande is another way in which it's it's different. This is 
uh, for its era and for its design space, this is a very text heavy game. You mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of Euro games of this era had no text at all. And the ones that did have text, they tended to be from very simple action cards that you held in your hand, right? It was not a question of, of, of table effects. Uh, and so again, this is one of the ways in which I think this really does, is a forerunner of a lot of the card driven games that are effect, essentially area majority games. Uh, this is, the, you know, compare this to a lot of the other games of 1995. This is a lot of text, a lot of words that's going on here. Not that there's a whole amount of reading to go on. It's just most other games like this, you don't, it's all language independent. Yeah, I know, was I say, usually it's, uh, you gotta go, what does this picture mean? Not what does the text mean? Yep. <laughs> well, it kind of helps it out a little bit potentially. Just, you know, like I think that had Agricola, you know, with its 350 cards in the base box, originally you know had they tried to make all those n like language independent oh yeah. boy that would be yeah. i feel like that would be a topic that's discussed in every single bit of media covering the game yeah i love me some race for the galaxy but i definitely don't want to have to learn a new symbolic language every time i yeah. play a new game <laughs> <laughs> and i could possibly imagine someone attempting to make el grande language independent but i don't think i'd want to play that edition no <laughs> I, I agree with you. So um, we've talked about all these different elements to the game, and I, I know that in your decennial edition, what all is included in there? Do you have do you have like the the pieces to any of the expansions, or did it focus on the base game? It has all of the expansions in it. Okay, so you do have everything now. Yes. Um, these expansions vary greatly um, in terms Absolutely. of whether or not they were even. Uh, given time of day by most players, you know, and once you get to like your third expansion down the line, a lot of times, you know, if you look at Board Game Geek ratings, like you'll have, you know, 6,000 for the base game reviews, then you'll get like a thousand for the first expansion ratings, and then yep. you'll go down, you know, it just starts petering off pretty quickly. Absolutely. Um, so we got the expansions. What do they look to do, Mark? Are you familiar with them at all? And, and you know, like what, what kind of change? Are you familiar at all with how they changed the, the formula of the base game? Yes. So there are basic, roughly speaking, there are three expansions, although admittedly one of the expansions, uh, the designers are great pains to say, this has a whole bunch of stuff. Use whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> Make up your own card stacks. Use the elements you like and leave out the rest of them, which you know kind of communicates a lack of editorial control, which I generally don't like, but more on that later. Mm -hmm. um, so these expansions so the most obvious expansion that one could produce for this game is just more action cards just put in more action cards and shuffle them in the deck none of the expansions are like that none of the expansions simply do that there are broad so as i say they're broadly th speaking three there is the grandissimo the grandissimo basically <laughs> he adds a sec sixth and seventh action card stack to the game and adds a number of other weird stuff besides now uh, here are the reasons why I don't like the, the, the this expansion in particular, and indeed any of the ones that use elements that are like this. One of the great things about El Grande is the tension of those five action cards that are revealed at the start of the round. If you're playing with four or five players, parenthetically, um, this, this is actually, we, we probably should have addressed this in its own topic, but parenthetically, I, I agree that El Grande is a little bit fragile in terms of player count. I wouldn't want to play El Grande with two or three players. I know lots of people who would even refuse to play it with four, but for me, it's strictly a four or five player game. Okay. Precisely because you're going to have five action cards available at the start of the round. And if it's the case that you're only two or three players, then there's not that same tension of wanting to go early, of wanting to be able to grab something. Because if you have four or uh, three or four action cards to, to select from, even when you're going last in the round, that's just a little too loose. That removes a lot of the competition. It doesn't make things as satisfying. But if you increase those numbers to seven, well, then even then, I think that's kind of turning, that's giving you some of that three-player game badness in a five-player game. So that's, that's <laughs> part of that is, is already just that level of uh, laxness and looseness in the system. The game is good because of the tension and trade-offs that it introduces. If you, if you minimize the tension and, and introduce fewer trade-offs, I'm not as big of a fan, first of all. Secondly, gen the, the effects are not what I would call as clean as everything else in the base game. It introduces a number of extra things to do on your turn other than the core element of moving cubes into your available supply and doing your action and placing cubes. Usually there's three core things you do on your turn. 
in Grandissimo and also in Grand Inquisitor. It adds a whole bunch of things about transferring cubes to a boat and then transferring the cubes from the boat to these other places. And you do that in addition to normal things in your turn, but you can only do it once during your turn, unless of course you have an action card that says you can do other things as well, in which case that supersedes the normal limitation as to when you do it in your turns anyway. It makes a clean game less clean. So it becomes less tense, less clean. Those are two things that I don't want in the Euro game. And for those reasons, I, I, I avoid the Grandissimo uh, expansion. The same thing is true of the, uh, the Grand Inquisitor and the Colonies. It adds more regions to the board, which in and of itself is fine. But to get there, it becomes very complicated about, again, transferring things mm -hmm. over. And it's kind of like, this is a bit of a strained analogy, but... One of the things that I find a little bit clumsy, this is just a little bit clumsy, is in the Hansa Teutonica map of Great Britain, the element of placing cubes into Scotland and Wales. You can only do it if you have this other condition met. And so into a game where placing cubes is very straightforward and very, very clean, there's this extra little roadblock. I think it works in the Hansa Teutonica example mm -hmm. of, of Scotland and Wales, but here, in moving cubes around, it kind of alters the fundamental turn structure, sort of in a way. Again, these free actions that you can do once during your turn, except when you can do it more. And on top of that, there's this element of picking things up and then having your cubes come back home and scoring things for doing that. It's a bizarre kind of pick up and deliver experience almost. <laughs> it's it's just it's it's grafting on additional systems to a game that I don't think needs it. So I, I get what you're saying. Like, whereas in Hans and Teutonica, what it did is it, it kind of like it added a still a lever a, a, a different path to getting to sort of the same place but that path had clearly delineated and still fragile and easy to interact with um limitations like you know you can only place one cube per turn and that's right. the trade-off because people can take control of that and now you can't even touch that region period right you know, like, and in, in the context of Hansa Teutonica, I think it works in part because one of the things about Hansa Teutonica is the board is relatively homogeneous. One route is very, very much like any other route in and of itself. You mm -hmm. know, you, you can place wherever you damn well please. And so suddenly there's this minor restriction on where you can place. El Grande already has these restrictions on where you can place. Yeah. Right? The location of the king and a whole bunch of other stuff that's going on. So the geography of the board of El Grande is already more dynamic in a way that Hansa Teutonica, uh, Hansa Teutonica's isn't. And that's fine. That's nothing against Hansa Teutonica. You and I both love the game. But yeah. I, I think that, so then adding that minor roadblock it's kind of sort of, it's not the same mechanically, but in terms of, of of tactical options, it's kind of like, where is the king now? Where am I being blocked? In Hansa Teutonica, it's about, you know, getting access to Scotland and Wales in that variant map. But El Grande didn't need that. It already had it. So when you have to introduce new bizarre actions outside the normal scope of the game merely to accommodate this additional new sub-mechanism that wasn't necessary, that's where I, I, I get off the train. Okay. It's almost like reinventing, they reinvented a wheel and it's and then they tried to tack that on to what was already a four-wheeled cart that had yeah. n no need for this extra. Yeah, and this is, this, this is nothing about complexity. I like, again, I like re re complicated games, but it's just, it's not, it doesn't add significantly to the core experience, but it adds significantly to a number of interactions that are not particularly satisfying. So just it, it I, I really think that Grandissimo and the Grand Inquisitor and the Colonies make the make the game worse. Okay. Yeah, and that that's I think that you're not alone in saying that. Uh not to say though, Mark, that by any means that the that the you know the the masses have you know have spoken, but I, I do understand like why this would is not necessarily considered integral to the the El Grande experience. It seems like it's more kind of like one of those peripheral expansions that gets thrown in because they bought the label with all of it coming yeah. with. You know, they yeah, it is mine is very much the consensus opinion. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't met I don't think I've encountered anyone either online that I trust or in person <laughs> that really is willing to go to bat for Grandissimo or the Inquisitor in the colonies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so we're nothing controversial so far. However, <laughs> there... but ask me about whether 9-11 was an inside job. <laughs> I'm just sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um the the Grand Inquisitor in the wait, well, you were just talking about the Grand Inquisitor. Sorry. Um, I was talking about Grandissimo and, and Grand Inquisitor and the Colonies. And colonies, which are which are those two separate ones, or do you consider those part of the same expansion? 
so there's okay so there's the grandissimo expansion okay and then there's another expansion that's called grand inquisitor of the colonies so okay. those are two of the three expansions okay and and now the last one though seems to have several different flavors because it's it's called king and intrigue right but then there's like a player's edition there's there's a king and intrigue one two and three right yep yep so king okay so intrigue and the king uh, or king and intrigue however you want to slice it is uh, first of all, it's compatible with the Colonies expansion. Mm -hmm. so you can play with that <laughs> and the Colonies If you like. Expansion. Yeah, if you like. <laughs> there, I think it even gets even worse because... Uh, <laughs> well, no, I like Intrigue in the King. I think it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Intrigue in the King does is it does away with the stacks of five action cards. They go mm -hmm. away. They're gone forever. So then it becomes an even worse fit with the, with the Inquisitor and Colonies expansion because then before the that that latter expansion added two more stacks of action cards to bring you to seven action cards but now you're playing with another expansion that does away with the action cards you're playing well, one expansion that modifies the stacks of action cards so it's kind of half in both both realms it's bizarre i've never played it that way uh <laughs> but it seems like utter lunacy and not in a good way <laughs> so intrigue in the king before just as a reminder you first play power cards and that sets up a turn order and when it's your turn you claim an action card and that that combination of those two is what really makes the game work intrigue in the king says what if both of those cards were the same cards mm -hmm. so that instead of playing a power card to set up a queue the power card that you're playing is also an action card so i play this card it has a number that'll determine turn order it has an action on it and it also has a number of cubes that i can move into my supply so far so straightforward but there are two things that i think really make it sing and really a fascinating uh, difference for the base game. One of them is, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> if you are the first player or the last player, namely if you play the highest number or the lowest number, whatever your action card says is blanched and is instead replaced by a generic either king action or intrigue action. This mm. is really, really fascinating because if somebody plays an action card that you know they that you cannot afford to let them get away with that thing, what you can do is attempt to make sure that they are either the highest card or the lowest card that is played around the table, thereby nuking the action they wanted to do and replacing it with another action they might not have wanted to do. That is super interesting. Now, sometimes it doesn't work because it requires not quite collusion from the rest of the table, but more or less everyone has to be on the same page. And sometimes it just so happens that someone's not, in, not willing to or isn't... Isn't, isn't affected cognizant. like you are. Precisely, or just isn't cognizant of the consequences of that particular action card. Sure. I've never seen it devolve into full-on table talk diplomacy, but you know, there's a certain <laughs> amount of, of table collusion that is required to get that happen. But it is a very, very interesting <laughs> dynamic. It also is just a very interesting dynamic about what action card to play. Because if you have an action card that, where you really, really want the action to happen, but it has a very low or high number, you need to be careful about when you pull it out. You need to be make sure that it will be during a round where you can actually do it. And that's really cool. The second thing that's really neat is that it has a bit of deck construction element. At the start mm -hmm. of the game, you're gonna have a stack of at least 18, but as many as 30 of these cards from which <laughs> you are going to pick 13 that you're going to use, that you'll have available over, over the course of the game. So, uh, the, so they recommend for your first game of this type, you just stick with the ones that are divisible by 10. So you get, there's a 10, a 20, a 30, all the way to 180. And you pick 13 of those and those are the ones you, you play. So everyone has access, even if you're playing with the, the sort of intro cards, everyone will have access to a different deck. So you don't know what numbers people have available to them. You'll sort of discover over the course of the game what cards they picked. And once you get into the, the, the bigger card sets up into 30 cards, you then get start uh, getting some pretty interesting different card effects. One mm -hmm. of them establishes a bridge between two province, uh, two regions that you yeah. can move cubes back and forth between. Huh. Some of them uh, modify scoring conditions or, or erect barriers to entry for other provinces. Or it's just you get some pretty interesting stuff uh, as a result of this. And so making those decisions at the start of the game allows it to basically be like a customized deck game where you build your own deck before you start the game. It's really really neat. It's also a little more uh, what you get additionally through this additional level of strategic planning at the beginning. The game feels a lot less chaotic because you're not getting a blind draw of five action cards at the top of every round. It's not the case that the uh, that the game state 
will be, you know, reinforming itself every round. It's just mm -hmm. the case that, you know, the revelation comes from seeing what other people have picked from their decks at the start of the game rather than the the, the top one being random. And it, yeah, so does this totally removes any uh, any randomness from the game, period, right? I believe so, yes. Other than initial setup, where you're, you know, where the king is, where you're Grande, yeah, I guess I should say, as, uh, beyond setup, there is literally going to be no randomness revealed in this expansion period. But it, it is like, holy crap, this is where you'd have to play that like nine rounds, right? Because you'd need to get to the to the to the slim pickings in your in your card deck to really see what's going on. Yeah, but that that tension already existed with the thirteen power cards at the beginning. I can't believe I didn't move yeah. you off the six round game business, Joe. I, I feel I feel I'm very disappointed. <laughs> oh no 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 no! no. <laughs> I, I it shows you how limited my experience is. I have played. I think I've played two intro games and then one uh, full like ninety, you know, like nine round game. So it's just that every time I've played it, it's been me teaching it to a table of new players, or you know, it's always been like table of new player situation. That's the only reason. How bad a teacher are you, Joe? <laughs> oh, I just can't get anybody to stick around, man. It's it really is, you know. I just repel everything, you know. It's somewhat by design, you know. There are a los, a los estudiantes de Señor Salen, me disculpes. <laughs> it is, you know, prickly and unapproachable has its benefits. There are also a few drawbacks. You you must understand this as well. The, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I am a cuddly fuzzball. <laughs> hailed as a hero in every way he's been. <laughs> so the the thing that really is intriguing about this expansion bleh, oh that was terrible that was the worst awful. thing anyone it's has awful. ever said you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned that the that the these card stacks um you know like the four and five player you only play this game with four and five because those card stacks don't you know dry up essentially yes. that badness of the three player game here they actually uh have different stacks of cards for different player counts now does that also then nerf you know do, does that not nerf or not give you the ability to um make these effects not happen does that impact the game you know does does it make it possible to play this with three maybe uh, I, I don't think it would be with two not in my not not a, not in my opinion. Here's why: uh, that interesting tension of trying to jockey someone into being a king or intrigue position that they don't want, trying to make sure <laughs> it gets the highest value or lowest value when they don't want that to be the case. Sometimes you do want it to be the case, in which case sometimes then you jockey to make sure that they're not the highest or lowest value. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, all of that jockeying goes away if you're playing with two or three, because if you're playing with two or three players, you obviously can't have it now be the case that the lowest value card <laughs> is, is, is nuked right it so when you're playing with two or three players that rule just goes away and mm -hmm. that if you are the highest value you can either do what's on your card or you can do the generic king action you're never obliged to do one or the other and so mm -hmm. since it takes that tension out of it i i find it relatively unsatisfying I mean, look let's let's be frank area majority games are tough to do with small player counts anyway yeah I think just like auction, auction games. Yeah. Exactly. It can be done. I mean, as as we just said earlier in the episode, Blue Moon is the brilliant, effectively auction game for two players. I'll play Raw two players, for crying out loud. I think the two-player variant of Raw works really, really well. Um, mm. And I think that, uh, you know, Han, China, Web of Power, whichever version you play, those play really well with, uh, with small player accounts as well. But those are the exceptions rather than the rule. It's usually really tricky to get those things done well. So I'm not, I don't think uh, El Grande's inflexibility is particularly that much worse than a lot of other area majority games. And again, uh, I'm more flexible than a lot of other people I know. I know a lot of people uh, who just will not play with anything other than five. Uh, huh. Which is interesting, though. Five-player games can be quite difficult to like track down really good ones. And when this is balanced for five, and that's where you want to see, you know, it it it's a gem to be able to reach for a five-player game and have it be this, you know, this well-tuned, fine-tuned for that player count. Yeah, and as I say, I don't find it loses all that much with four. But again, mm -hmm. if you get to the point where suddenly the last player is able to pick from three cards, that's just a little too that's just a little too loose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really look in terms of just in, in terms of where it sits and uh, with respect to, to other competing games, this is again very much again like Hansa Teutonica, despite the fact they're very different games. But I think that really excellent Euro games tend to have a number of features in common. There's tons of player interaction and tons of conflict in El Grande, but never in a way where you feel like you're being punched in the face. It's mm -hmm. always in a way where you feel like it's now your obligation to go and 
redeploy elsewhere, recommit your energies in a, in a, in a more fruitful place uh, to, to really be able to, 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 to maneuver around in such a way that you're able to start new fights elsewhere rather than constantly feeling locked into a place. It's that fluidity that really, really undercuts any sense of rancor or, uh, or, or bad feelings, despite the fact that in many ways this is, like the old cliche goes, a knife fight in a phone booth. <laughs> there's constant competition over any number of things mm -hmm. yeah you can really hold the salt for your next action oh yeah well is there anything that we haven't covered yet mark i would like to ask something oh tc yes i'm gonna speak up now um how can i phrase this why do you think the value of us playing a game like this that's older over playing some of the newer ones i mean what what would specifically brings you back to this particular game over other ones. Well, in this particular case, look, I, I'm not, I'm not in favor of playing classics just because they're classics. Right? Uh -huh. This is not about uh, nostalgia or anything like that. I play El Grande because it is better at what it does than anything else that 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 I play. Seriously, like that, that that's just the long and the short of it. When it comes to uh, every time I play an area majority game or when I've played the coin games, or when I play lots of other games of this ilk that try to introduce an ops versus event tension, that, you know, look at that successful war game mechanism and say, hey, let's graft this back to a Euro game. My response is, hey, it already was grafted from a Euro game. El Grande <laughs> did it great. The last time I, this really happened was when I played The Expanse. I don't know if any of you played The Expanse. No. But uh, after I played The Expanse, I'm like, this was a total waste of time. El Grande did it a billion times better 25 years ago. And that's that's why I keep playing the game. It's if you like that sort of uh, card driven element of an ops versus event tension, you owe it to yourself to play this game. Everybody who's ever enjoyed a coin game or a card driven war game of any type that hasn't played El Grande, you're doing yourself a disservice because this is really it really captures that same uh, the same element there. The joy of having to navigate event cards while at the same time dealing with limited resources and having to pick very careful fights. Uh, it, it's really is one of those, the, the, the joy of those kinds of experiences really cuts across all kinds of, whether it's Ameritrash or Euro or hardcore war gamers or light Euro gamers or heavy Euro gamers, all those kinds of genres really, I think, are trying to get at some of the experiences that El Grande got so right. And it really is the case that when it comes to you know pure area majority Euros, for me, it's just this and Han. Those are the only two that I need. And uh, yeah, so that, that's why I, I keep bringing it back to the table whenever I can. Now, I, I grant you, it's a hard sell. The market has moved on in terms of components and visual designs. Uh, you know, Do Doris Mathaus, who did the, uh, the artwork here, she of, of Carcassonne fame, mm -hmm. you know, painted, painted those lovely yellow hues everywhere, and it's tan on sepia <laughs> on yellow. And it's got you know <laughs> uh, that that great faux historical theming that Euro games have been moving past for the pa uh, past ten years as well they mm -hmm. should. And so I'm, <laughs> look, I'm not going to tell you that it weaves any kind of narrative. I'm not going to tell you there's any kind of uh, grand immersion going on. But uh, in terms of a great way to have a conflict interaction laden game with lots of tense choices, confrontations, and trade offs, you can do a lot worse than El Grande. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's that really well sums up, you know, it's, you know, playing a game because of nostalgic value is something that, you know, I, I think that you've explained why this, you know, you don't need to rely on that to reach for El Grande. It's yeah. not like, yeah, it's not like, oh, I have fond memories of this. Like, for example, if I were going to pick up, you know, a card game like Euchre, I, I would go to it simply because I have these fond childhood memories. You know, is there games that have replaced it? Yes, but there's nothing that's euchre. Well, that's not the case with El Grande. El Grande was, you know, in, in many ways, the first and the, you know, the central uh, exemplary, you know, the, all these tensions were created here and still haven't been replaced because what all these other games do is kind of add more maybe context to what's going on, but that context still doesn't actually change the mechanisms in necessarily like a, a, a meaningful way for just mechanisms themselves. There are lots of games that I love from the 90s and earlier. Uh, and, you know, there are lots of games from that era that I even prefer over El Grande. But one thing that El Grande has over all those other ones is when I'm playing El Grande, I, I'm honestly hard pressed to think of any element other than the graphic design that feels dated. 
because a lot of those things that uh, are the, the bugbearers of game design, like ties in scoring mechanisms like this, like play order, which tends to be hugely consequential, they are often serious problems that you know really hold back a design or when you play a game that, that's that old, you figure, oh, well, you know, I love this game, but this element's really dated. Uh, El Grande doesn't feel dated because it does, it, in many ways, it solved problems that many games that are published today still have. Now, I'm not saying that they should all, that all games should work like El Grande and they should all save, uh, solve, quote unquote, solve them in the same way. But it, it really is a testament to a game that not only do I love it without any nostalgia value, it, there's nothing about it that feels clunky in a 25 year old kind of way. And in the iterative game design space, like the, the, the games that we play, that's really high praise. True, it is very high praise. I mean, it, this is what you'd call, you know, like one of those timeless classics that I yep. think the long view, you know, it's it's the bread and butter of the long view. And I appreciate you, you know, you, you being the spreader there, Mark. Well, that's been a very, very good discussion. It's been very cool. <laughs> I, I it's it's what it blow my mind because I had no idea that uh y you know that even when, just when we talked about like the king and intrigue expansion like the way that that affects you know just changes up and adds that sort of deck construction I mean there's so many different pieces here that were explored in interesting ways and and uh you know but that central core mechanism is just you know it it, it works because all these little pieces that come into the you know that, that like affect the formula but conserve and sort of I don't know they don't like nothing really clouds enough from its core to to make it you know to, to confuse and you know to to make it I think really one that players can would, would hate it's like if you dislike this game I feel like I would first think well do you like any area control or area majority games period you know is is an area majority game your type of game because if you'd say that you like area majority games but not El Grande I'm going to sit there and rub my chin for a while Yeah yeah it's the only people that I've introduced it to that didn't like the game are uh and I say this with all due respect uh people who only want to play a game if there are little plastic figures that are going around killing each other and <laughs> no seriously I, there are some people I play games with that are like that and this, uh, you know, El Grande didn't change their mind. That having been said, there are lots of other people whose horizons are slightly broader that I needed to give the hard sell to on the basis of the graphic design in the box because, again, the market's moved on. And uh, But by the end of it, they were, you know, staring at the board with that scowl of, uh, that, of, <laughs> of, of intense concentration and of competition that really makes a game explainer feel that they've done their job well and introduce people to an experience that they're, that they're really taking seriously and engaging with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. It's a hard sell, but it's a worthy sell. Yeah, it, it, it's worth it. I've, uh, I've never regretted. I don't think I've ever had a bad game of El Grande. Uh, and uh, it's it's worth it, it's a system that's not only worth devoting the effort to getting to the table. It's also a system that's worth uh, devoting a, 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 a the the necessary thought of multiple plays to because it really does d reveal extra layers of depths about ways to get the most out of what is in many ways, as you say, a relatively tight system. Uh, mm -hmm. But it 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 does reveal. Uh, new layers uh, upon repeated repeated plays, and I've not regretted any time I've spent with it. Well, I feel the same way, Mark, about having you on this episode uh, on on the Long View podcast. Aww. So, yeah. Aww. Mm -hmm. Well, Thanks, with, even with the coin beat down, you are nice to have on. <laughs> <laughs> it's very it very interesting connections that you made between you know current releases and and El Grande, and I think that that just further makes this in, an episode that I think is going to be relevant to people that are new into the hobby and, and ones that were around, you know, back in the day when El Grande was what you played. It was, it was the, the, <laughs> the annual release, you know, that we got on, on this side of, of the Atlantic. So um, I, I thank you very much for joining and I look forward to the next time that we get to, uh, to, to, to hear from you about, what will probably end up being either China or I think we've already brought up a couple of games. <laughs> You said Every it was game Quinn? We was that the one. revamp of it, Quinn? Con. Con, yeah. Okay, I've played that one. I was like, a that sounded real familiar. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, there's uh, there's a couple other ones that got brought up there. I mean, we've already, you know, we're already scheduling our next episodes, which is always a great way to feel because I, you know, I just never want to lose touch with, uh, you know, such an intriguing 
uh, it, 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 the, the king of intrigue. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So worried that we were going to end on a sappy sentimental note so thank you very very much for getting the bile back in my throat <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome the uh would you like to quickly i mean we already mentioned at the beginning of the podcast but you know tell people how how to find you you know how to seek you out if they if they uh like your particular brand of nonsense uh, well, first of all, you have my pity then. Uh, every week, <laughs> my partner, Mike Walker, and I release our podcast, which is called So Very Wrong About Games. You can find us on your favorite podcatcher under those terms. You can find our, us collectively on Twitter at So Wrong Games, and you can find me personally on Twitter at All The Games You Like. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been great, TC. Thanks. Uh, you know, it's great to hear from you as well. And good luck, you know, keep keep uh, getting healthy over there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I plan on going to eat, um, take my wife out to eat. It's going to be a great afternoon. I think I'll tell you my um, my story with El Grande. Uh, maybe you can appreciate this here, Mark. As a, for a while, I was running around with Chaos in the Old World as one of my favorite games of that type. Sure. And, you know, every time anybody brings an Eric Lane game, I'm like, well, why should I play that when I have Chaos in the Old World? I don't, I don't, <laughs> you, have, you, have, you have Blood Rage? Oh, that's neat. I have Chaos in the World. Oh, you have Rising Sun? Oh, well, someone went to me and said, well, why are you playing this when there's El Grande? And I was like, <laughs> what's El Grande? There's not plastic demons and stuff. Why should I care? But he he persisted and brought it out, and I was really impressed. I was like, wow, you're kind of right. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, the yeah. Eric Lang before Eric Lang. <laughs> yeah, so that was a uh, anyway. But I, I I hear you. It's difficult to get people who prefer plastic minis to get to play it. But I'm I'm one of the converts. I I, I, I saw the truth. <laughs> There's room in the Castillo for all of us. Yeah, that's, that's nice to know. <laughs> before we go our separate ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're really cagey. We don't tell each other where we're going. We just you know we just walk off yeah. in our own directions. Oh, you're here? Crap. Yeah. I, was <laughs> I had not planned on you sending, uh, you coming here too. Uh. <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, thank you to all the listeners that have that have been uh, participating in this uh, with, with your patronage. And also, don't forget to check out Game Surplus, gamesurplus.com. They sponsor the Longview, and we really appreciate them as well. So yeah, they, we, will they heard that earlier in the intro, so yay. <laughs> yay! We will hear you next time on the Longview. Or you, you will hear from us next time in the long view, man. You, edit that out. You. You're gonna, you know what? TC always, whenever I make a mistake, it, it gets immortalized. So it so goes good. to the beginning. There it you goes go. to the beginning of the queue. So that's the way it works out. <laughs> Wait, you, all right. you, guys, you guys don't install hidden mics in the computers of all your listeners? <laughs> we well, we that's all, that's only the use to yet. get you back on, Mark. I mean, if you decide now you go, but that's when we're gonna rip that out. <laughs> We were slow rolling that announcement, Mark, but since you brought it up, uh, yeah, there's some new technology, you know, Google. <laughs> well, it'll be until the next episode, which uh, we aren't going to be recording for a long time. So anyway, uh, but, you know, people listen to us on podcasts. You'll you'll keep hearing uh, regular. This will be the end of, you know, like a series of regular releases. But anyway, it's uh, been a way to sort of a, a good way to end it here and looking forward to when we get to have you back on, Mark. Thanks, everything, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.